Today's episode is brought to you by Gray Block Pizza, and that's a great place to get a pizza pie. He's a college football superhero and uh, and an embodiment of perseverance. He's one third of the Business and Biceps podcast squad, uh, and they will be joining us later. It is Maurice Claret. How long have you been out here? I've been out here about 14 years, I guess. So doing 14 stand-up. years would it be back in 04? Yeah, actually, I guess maybe about 02 or 03. Oh. And when, when and when were you here? You lived in oh, Los Angeles. Yeah, January 04. Yeah. Fe- January, February 04, yeah. Yeah. And was that fun? Like, that was a was that a fun time in your life? Or what was that like, being Beautiful. out here? Beautiful. Beautiful. So just for my listeners, so if we could, could you kind of, if you could, I know this might be absolutely impossible, uh, Maurice Claret, could you sum up like kind of f- like football and some of the Ohio State stuff, maybe in like, mm-hmm. you know, about two or three minutes or whatever you think you can? Yeah, for people who may not be familiar. Uh, well, you know, I came out just as a highly touted uh, a recruit from around the nation. Uh, went to Ohio State and in, uh, in the first time in history started as a running back for Ohio State. Uh, went out and, and went and won a national championship within my first year. Yeah, uh, a huge amount of success uh, from a personal level and from a you know obviously a career level. Uh, and in the process of doing that, I always put it in context. I got to remember that uh, LeBron is about a year younger than me. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so around and, that time. Yeah, and so LeBron grew up maybe forty minutes away from me. And this is at the height of LeBron basically going to become LeBron, you know, in high school when he's selling out co- college stadiums. And at this time, you have, uh, you know, 50 Cent's a new rapper. Jay-Z's fairly new. He had, like, the Blueprint 2 out. Uh, and I can just remember after having so much success and watching LeBron have his success, I can remember uh, just me sort of losing focus as uh, as a college kid. Oh, I see. So you kind of said uh, you kind of followed that, like, his path, even though it wasn't your path, maybe. Yes. You know, and I'm speaking uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I can remember uh, after being done with the season and, you know, as an 18-year-old kid, you won everything in high school. Fast forward 13 months later, you won everything in college. Uh, all of the adults around, uh, I don't blame this on them because everybody's enjoying the moment. Uh, when you're famous or popular or, or notarized, nobody tells you no. You yeah. Know? Oh, and yeah. You get all, you get it all. Everybody's just telling you yes. And I can just remember... Uh, I can remember when 50 Cent had the In the Club song and it came to Ohio. Oh, the best. best. Still one of the best <laughs> albums. Still one of the best albums. Period, yes. And I can just remember, uh, you know, LeBron asking, oh, let's go up to Cleveland State and let's enjoy this. And I remember Nike, Reebok, Adidas, all these guys were chasing him. And I could just remember um, uh, just enjoying that a bit too much. Yeah. And in, and in the reality of it is that I ended up getting suspended from uh, having too many illegal benefits. It wasn't LeBron's fault. Right. You know what I'm saying? But just, you know, just doing too much. <laughs> And uh, what ended up happening was, uh, and I always say it, that was probably the most impactful time uh, from an individual standpoint because that was the first time I actually felt like depression. Yeah. You know, never had really went through anything uh, from a mental standpoint, never uh, felt anything adverse from a... Um, uh, from a personal level, mm-hmm. uh, outside of sports, you know, in sports, if you if you have a hard time, you can you know watch film, you can lift weights, you can get in better conditioning, you can you know as a comedian, you can learn how to tell better jokes. But from a personal standpoint, uh, I just didn't know how to process that. That was a tougher thing. Yeah, and that's an age when like the voice inside of your head starts to become like a real voice. I feel like at that point, you can yes. hear it more. You yes. Know? And so you know, uh, obviously, I didn't realize that prior to that. Uh, from having so much success, there was so much sex, drinking, drugging. Yeah. But it was done in a celebratory standpoint, from a st- celebratory standpoint. Like, right. you know, I'm celebrating a game or hanging out with the fellas. It, it switched from uh, having celebrations to me masking what I really felt. Yeah. Because I can't go play the sports. I can't go play the game. I have no, like, fucking clue as to what's going on in my life. And so that's kind of like where, where, where life like kind of really met me at. And that's like a, like a, a gray space. Oh, you know, yeah. Nobody can kind of navigate out of this and nobody knows what's going on. You know what's going on. You don't want to reveal your feelings. And that's kind of like what really had happened with me. And you probably can. I mean, at that point, like it, you couldn't trust the media very much. It was like, I'm sure you were probably sc- not scared, but just directionless, maybe. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so, so just to put context to it, uh, after I got kicked out of school, uh, there was a two year waiting period before I was allowed to go to the NFL. And at that time, uh, I really thought that the NFL would let me enter the draft because, right. you know, I was big enough, strong enough and everything else. Uh, but when they didn't allow me to enter the draft, I was just kind of like sitting 
two years away from football. So I ended up going to Vegas to uh, watch. Uh, it was a uh, it was a Roy Jones and Antonio Tarver fight. I go out there and uh, when I watch it, I'm in the House of Blues and Jim Brown was out there. Jim Brown hits me up. He says, "Yo, you know, I remember I helped you out with your um, uh, your case at Ohio State. Can mm-hmm. you please, like, you know, get away from that environment? You just don't look like the same individual that I seen, you know, a, a oh, few wow. months prior to that. And so that was the original reason for me coming out to L.A. So when I came to, out to L.A., so you took that to heart when Jim Brown said that. Yeah, because you know he had seen me as the uh, the 19 year old kid who still was wanting to play football and everything like that. And when he seen me at the Antonio Tarver fight, that was probably seven months later, eight months later. Different you different me you know i had partied all night you know we up to four oh, or five yeah. in the morning you know you know you know that look you know oh, what i'm yeah. saying dude, <laughs> so, i know that look i saw one time i i used to get go buy makeup dude i'd be so i never <laughs> i never wore makeup in my life dude i'd be in the, i'd be in a 24-hour cvs at like 5 a.m trying to get yourself together <laughs> asking people about bronze or in blush yeah. i'm just trying to look okay for a meeting in the morning <laughs> so yeah i feel you 100 yeah. percent it, and so, so he I, saw you and he said, uh, he, he kind of just, you know, uh, commented and then you moved to Los Angeles. Yeah, commented and I moved out here with the, the whole motivation to come out here and to gather myself. And uh, when I got out here, what I didn't realize is that, you know, he had, he was in North Carolina or South Carolina, wherever he was at. And there was a period of time when I was out here by myself waiting for him to come back out. Who, Jim Brown? Jim Brown. Yeah. And so when I got out here, I was like, all right, you know, I'm cool. Uh, I, I kind of got away from Ohio too, you know, uh, like during the process of me getting away, you know, I got back into the streets. I'm selling dope. I'm selling weed. I'm hustling. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was full-fledged into the streets, and I'm full-fledged away from everything sports-related. Mm-hmm. I'm just all the way deep in the hood, right? I separate myself. I come out here uh, because th- th- throughout that process also, uh, and I was talking to John this morning, I got almost robbed three times. And the last time that I almost get robbed, my mother was in the house. You know, some guys on our bushes oh, wow. uh, ended up uh, coming outside. You know, we was in the suburbs at the time. So these guys ran off. You know, by that time I was like, man, I got to get the fuck out of here. You know, it's too I, close I, to home. Too close to home. And do you think you were in those streets? Like, do you think you went back into drugs and into like, or into selling that type of environment? Because there's still a level of you probably got a uh, a lot of street cred did you well i think like was it just for the hustle was it just for money or do you think there was because there's a you know there's a level you can always have a claim at in the streets i feel like Mm -hmm. that you that's different than you know in the in the world like in society like in the streets if your cloud is a certain level it's kind of always there It's it's in that space well when I look back on it, um, there, there was a few things that put me in the streets. One, my brother had needed money because he had just got arrested. Okay. Right? He had needed money for an attorney. The second thing that put me back into the streets is just familiar, familiarity. Yeah. You know, if I can say it right, right? Just a familiarity of how do I take care of myself. And I think there's some sort of glorification that when you come from the hood, um, the machoism of selling drugs and the coolness right. is attractive. You know right. So it's something still almost as cool as athletics in a way. In a way. It, it, you still, you're still allowed to be a somebody, yes. right? And my access to me being able to get drugs from people, uh, the, the drugs that I was selling, they, they, these pe- it was easy to get to these people. Yeah. So, so, so I'm, I'm speaking from that perspective. Right. And I got to say, and also just from being, just being a, a bit more realer, uh, I, I was just a dumb fuck when it came to school. Right. You know what I'm saying? So there was nothing like, you know, let me go ahead and get an education and, you know, football's not working out. Let me go ahead and, and live my life in some academic format. So it just wasn't there. You just couldn't even pay attention in school. It just wasn't your thing. It, it just wasn't interesting. Like when, when you look back on it, uh, when you grew up in an environment, you know, like um, when you grow up in an environment, the only thing that you see as being successful, what you deem successful is guys either selling dope or the cool guys or the athletes. That's the yeah. only thing that you want to gravitate to as a kid. Especially like probably growing up black in America at yes. your age. I mean, I remember the only successful black men I even knew growing up uh, were the guys on Coming to America. No joke. Or the <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. When I really think about it as a child, like even, gotcha. or the guy on uh, In the Heat of the Night, the, you know, Virgil Tibbs. Virgil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, when I think back, like that's who I, it's like, there was only a really, yeah, like I remember, a and I've talked about group. this before. Yeah, if I even remember watching commercials for like Disneyland or something like that, it was always white people. Yes. Like there was probably, yeah, so I can only imagine what the vision probably looked like being a young black child, you know? Yeah, so, so you, you just you just put that into context. And so you got you to gotta put everything in context. You, you're more, more about being cool is important to you rather than... Yeah doing the right thing and building your life yeah. at, at 18, 19 years old. Cool you know what I'm saying? It. Oh, cool as it. Cool as it. And so 
the selling of the drugs makes me, makes me cool to the women. Right. The selling of the drugs gets me money in my pocket to do foolish shit, to buy champagne, to buy liquor. But you don't realize the habits that you're forming from this are detrimental to you. Yeah. So at that point, uh, I can remember I'm out in Ve- at that time in Vegas, and Jim Brown's like, "Yo, slow down." Like, yo, know, like just slow down. I can remember even, I remember at that time too, James Prince was out there. I remember James Prince was like, yo, you're tripping. You know what I mean? Because he had seen me as a regular football player. And then to see me in that condition, I can remember him saying like, yo, you're tripping. Man. You know what I'm saying? Slow your ass down. So I came out here and in the process of Jim Brown not being around, I went down to Sunset. Yeah. When I go down to Sunset, when I'm going into Hollywood, when I'm partying all day. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know. Partied on a Monday. Never heard of fucking party on a Monday. Party on a Tuesday. Party on a Wednesday. You know, <laughs> party on a Thursday. Hey, come get this brunt. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but it's cra- Hollywood's crazy, man. It Hollywood's will, you crazy. can always find it. You can find it. it. There's a group of people that it just never ends. So, so just take like this. So, put this in the context. I'm from Ohio. Yeah. I'm from Youngstown and Columbus, Ohio. I don't care how progressive you think Ohio is. If you're from Ohio, it's still slow in comparison to these larger cities oh, yeah. and how they do stuff. So in Ohio, if you're uh, fucking drunk out of your mind and high out of your mind at fucking two in the afternoon, somebody would say you're crazy. Yeah. In LA, they walk past you like there's no big deal. Yeah. You know, because this is a social function. And so I got caught into that crowd mm. and it was just a good time. But also in Ohio, you can be very popular. You can come to LA, you can hide. Right. Nobody knows you. So they don't know that uh, your accountability for being a professional, uh, th- there's no accountability. Right. They don't know that. Yeah, there's no accountability. You can fake it. It's all, you, yes. there's no, you can't see any of the behind the scenes of anyone here, really. No. Like in in a smaller city, you can see, you might run into Maurice's cousin or Maurice's aunt or yes. a friend of Maurice's who's like, he's not doing well. Or here, everybody will lie to prop everybody up. Yes. And nobody even knows what anybody's really doing anyway. And, and nobody really knows. And so from there, you know, obviously a party and- Jim Brown reached out to me a couple of times and I went to his house up in the hills and just from the the discipline he tried to implement on me, I was resistant for him. I was like, yo. How, just... much, how much of Africa is in Jim Brown's house? I bet I could see him having <laughs> masks. I could see him having like traditional Mombasa nah. warriors. Like I bet he gets really real in there, does he? No, nah, he's a serious dude. Uh, he's serious and just, he has, he has a great spirit and a great soul, but uh, if 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 if, if, I, if I remember correctly, just a bait, like this very basic house. Wow. Uh, but one thing he talks about is his view. Like if you go up there, you can just see the whole city. Like it's a phenomenal view. Yeah. And uh, he, he always hosts like, uh, and he probably still does it to some degree. He used to host like meetings at his house every Monday and Tuesday. Nice. And bring different dudes from different gangs all over LA to his house and, you know, bring in uh, just people who would speak. And it was just about basically basic fellowship on life. So he's big on that. Yeah, so he had the American program, and this was helping guys transition from prison, giving them job skills, giving them uh, different support once they were re- released back into society. So he had felt that since he's dealing with people who are gangsters, that they would take me in like a little brother mm-hmm. and provide some structure for me to basically get better. Great idea, but I just wasn't ready for you it. Ready for you that. know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yeah. you can, in my mind, I was a celebrity. In my yeah. mind, I'm like, fuck, I'm somebody from Ohio. I'm not about to come out here and listen to guys and have structure and discipline and go to bed. It's and hard to hear. It's hard no. to hear when you're a celebrity, isn't it? Yes. When you yes. think about when you, it? When you think you're a celebrity. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. When you think you're a celebrity, when yes. your ego really starts to puff up, it's hard to, you can listen to people, you can look at people, but it's hard to really hear them. It's, there's something yes. that's, it's, that's different. I, mean, I would call it, there's no discernment, right? So, because um, this is what happens. You, you get to a space with how you've always wanted to live your life. Right. So, you know, I, I grew up in the MTV Cribs era. Always, yeah. always say that, right? Oh, yeah. And so to a kid, that is impressionable. You know, if I, if I made it, you know, like who doesn't like, let, let's like, you know, I have a woman, we've been together 14 years, right? But in that space, I want to have sex with the most beautiful women. Yeah. I want money everywhere. I want a fucking Bentley outside. I want a Rolls Royce outside. I just want to live life. Oh, yeah. So anything that you get. Tigers. Everybody gets tigers. <laughs> yeah, Shit, yeah, what does that do, man? <laughs> So you know what I'm saying? You 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 get to a uh you're living some sort of pseudo moment in your head, you don't want this to end. Right. And so now you're 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 coming to me as an advisor with a great advice. 
And I'm like, fuck, like, it makes sense, but this isn't helping me to do all this shit that I want to do. Right. Like, this isn't helping me, you know, fuck all these girls. This isn't helping me be cool in the club. And fame is, like, fame or notoriety is fucking intoxicating. It's intoxicating, you know? especially when you don't have a lot of feelings already inside of yourself that kind of, um, that you can notice that sort of thing. Like, you don't have, like, a real framework or a groundwork that builds you up from the inside any, you know, any yes. way. Um, and I'm not saying that you don't, I'm, you know, I'm just saying no, even from my point, own life, no, it's no. like, I know that there's things, it's like, man, when things come in, that seems appealing. Yeah. Um, but, but you, you gotta ask yourself, when, when did you figure out the discovery process of knowing yourself? You know, nobody's thinking 18, 19 years 35 old. 35 maybe. Come on. Like, l listen to me. I, I'm still at, what do I value? How do I love myself? You know, what is really important to me? I was sitting down today with John having coffee. I said, man, like I'm having fun sitting on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, table outside having coffee at starbucks yeah i can appreciate just cars going by you know what i'm saying right different different appreciation oh uh, yeah i mean it's uh yeah i mean i got a you know i'm a sober guy now so i got in a program about two and a half years ago and that's gotcha. the first time that i started learning to, that's the first time i could almost really even hear anybody like before that life was just this it was great and there were great moments and it was i was i was involved and invested but i just couldn't I don't know. The things hadn't lined up enough. It was still too much of a Rubik's Cube, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. um, but not to take your story away. So so you end up back out here. Uh, Jim Brown has you up in the hills. He's trying to help out. Yes. And so at that time, I disconnected from him and, and all things responsible. Ended up uh, coming and, uh, and, and met another gentleman. Real, still a good friend today. To my, to, still a good friend to me today. Uh, and his name was Hot. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's he was obviously in the thirty for thirty. Oh yeah, I saw him in the thirty for thirty. Yeah. Yep. So and and Hi, I met High, and I, at that time High uh, was under a, a federal federal case, you know, federal racketeering case, and and, and that's highly noted, uh, and all over the internet. And so what happened was we ended up going to a party at his house, and uh, he lived out in the marina. And as we went to the party at the house, uh, I ended up bumping into him. To make a long story short, you know, we was just uh, talking shit to each other, uh, just you know, like who are you, where are you from, like how did you get out here. Uh, we ended up partying some more that night, and then he was just like, yo, like, you're kind of from Ohio, you've landed in L.A., you don't know anybody out here, like, you know, hook up with me, like, let me help you get your shit together. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand, like, even how it happened, even when I look back now, but it was, like, one of the best, it was one of the best and worst things to happen to me. Uh, the best because I got a friend and a brother for life. Like, mm -hmm. that was that was uh, guaranteed. Uh, there was also, um, like, a cool deal of just me getting exposed to other people who are successful outside of uh, athletics. Okay, you right. Know? You got in the in crowd. Yeah. So I, I I never knew somebody. So they they own a shit ton of real estate. You know, probably a couple billion dollars uh, worth of real estate. And I could just remember thinking to myself, I'm like, how the fuck are these people so rich? You know, right. As naive as it sounds, at 20, 19, 20 years old, I never seen somebody who had had money outside of athletes. I, right. could, I couldn't even conceive of right. people being like that massively successful. And so um, what ended up happening was that he was under a, a, a racketeering case, you know, uh, at that time. And he was getting ready to uh, go to trial, like maybe that next summer. Right. And so every day he would get up at eight in the morning and he would have his curfew at 11, but he thought he was going to prison for a long time. So it was all about living life to the fullest. Right. Okay. And you were, and you were on that wave. And, and I was just, I happened to be a part of the boat. Wow. So, I'm uh, out here trying to semi-train for football, nothing really serious, and I'm also around him every day because this is the only person I know, right? So we're talking about a guy who has three or four fucking Bentleys, oh, yeah. a fucking house in Beverly Hills, a house in fucking uh, by the beach. And just seeing that as a young man, it can't, ha it really, uh, I could imagine probably in your scenario, I don't even, I don't know if it could help that much. Bro, seeing all that, it, it, you know? So, but, but it makes it worse, and, and I, I gotta say this, one of the worst things that can happen is that you get into a vehicle or you get around people who are super successful and you lose sight that this is their success. You're right. just living in it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And so the hunger for me to want to become something had faded because I thought I made it. Yeah. And 19, 20 years old, you're not processing like this is their shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? But you have a sex with beautiful women, you know, because there's a lot of beautiful, insecure oh, yeah. women out here. Right. Oh, yeah. It's You're, the sex belt out here, man. It's it's the sex belt. Think about this. You have a Mercedes. I got a 2004, five Mercedes 604 in my garage. It's 2004. You have a 745 out here. It's brand new cars. You're living in the marina. Yeah. You know, you got money in your pocket. You're partying every You got day. goldfish made out of real gold. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I remember they couldn't even swim. Like, damn, those fish are heavy, man. Yeah. Like, you, that's a 14 karat flounder right there. <laughs> you know, they got all kind of stuff. 
so you so you so you have the bad scenario you get caught up um you you have you have influences but but their life isn't your life yes. and you're starting to believe that it is or of course at that yes. age who wouldn't i'm start i'm starting to it's, but it's easier to live the lie and you end up so and i remember you ended up back in the nfl yes combine yes went back to the nfl went to the combine failed horribly I ended up coming back to L.A., and as I come back to L.A., I'm thinking, like, I'm not going to get drafted anymore. And after I ended up getting drafted uh, in the third round, I went to uh, Denver, and really it was just a shit show in a nutshell. I couldn't stop partying. I was literally going to the clubs, and we'll stay out till maybe 3 or 4 in the morning, and we have to be to practice at 7. So I'm coming to practice in the morning like, shit, you know what I'm saying, not just a professional athlete. And I always talk about Denver because I can't I can't really shit on Denver. They tried to help me, right? Yeah. So throughout the process, they tried to sit me down with a sports psychologist, and they said, hey, you know, can you please slow down, you know, get with the sports psychologist and allow her to assist you because they kept on saying, you've experienced a lot of trauma before you've come to here, right? Yeah. And stability. So at my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm not about to sit here and talk to this lady. One, because she was a lady, and two, I think that I'm a gangster, and this is like an old white lady trying right. to talk to me about- This thing to help. Ignorance. You know, yeah. not that she has some information, but just pure ignorance. So you fast forward that story. We're getting ready to play the um, Indianapolis Colts. This is the third game of the preseason. They come to me again, and they say, hey, can you sit down and uh, work with the sports psychologist, but also get on the practice squad? Like, just sit yourself down, like, allow us to develop you. Right. In my mind, I processed that as I'm not good enough and wow. you want to sit me out. Yeah. Couldn't see the forest for the trees, right? Yeah. So the next thing you know, I push her away. They call me that next day. They cut me that morning. I end up getting on the plane, coming back to LA. And when I got here, you know, the depression went from like, you know, a two oh, yeah. to a negative 40, right? And it's building behind the scenes and you don't even know it. No, absolutely. It's such a monster, the way that depression and that kind of stuff, and anxiety, all of the, it can be building in your base and you don't even realize it. 100%, 100%. And when I get here, this is when I knew I was real fucked up. Like sometimes like, you know, you have moments of clarity where you can identify how you really feel. I went to a party off of Sunset and I can remember like it was yesterday, I'm standing in the party and as I'm standing there, the whole party's going on and I literally had smoked before I came, I had drunk before I came and I literally felt nothing. Damn. Didn't feel high, didn't feel drunk, didn't feel connected to the moment, didn't feel the party, didn't feel the music, like just was like in this like stale space. Yeah. You know, so anybody ever been fucked up off of drugs know what I'm talking about, right? So the next thing you know, I get um I get in the party, I'm I'm, I'm fucking around and uh, uh, I was like, man, I got to get the fuck out of here. I just knew I had to uh, exit L.A. Yeah. So I get back to the house. Uh, I went to, uh, at that time, I was banking with fucking whoever that next day. Withdrew my money because they didn't have the same bank in Ohio. Caught a one-way ticket to Ohio. And went home. Left all my shit, right? So I connected with my coach when I came back home. And uh, when I connected with him, the whole thing was like, hey, you know, I need to get my shit together. I feel lost. Like, I'm just, like, totally disconnected from uh, fucking reality. So... I ended up coming back to Ohio. Uh, when I got back here, uh, the coach had gave me a bunch of instructions, like, you know, uh, a bunch of shit to do to help me. Direction, get my yeah. Direction, Did you follow right? it? Uh, no, but he always, talk, he always talks about, Coach Trussell always talks about takeaways after we're done talking. And uh, he said, you know, I need you to go back to school, but then I also need you to get in better shape. The first thing was like fucking shit ton hard because I couldn't get back in school because I didn't know how to do the fucking work, right? right. So I, re I was rejecting yeah. that in the back of my head. The second one, I said, okay, I'll start to get in shape. So as I started to get in shape and wake up and go to the gym that he referred me to, like I started to feel better, look better the whole nine. But what happened was I had a ton of free time on my hands, right? Yeah. So I'm 21 at this time, ton of free time on my hands, no money, can't pay for rent, really didn't have like the humility to go get a job. Right. Back really, to the streets. Like, yeah. Back to the streets. And Where so, you're still a king. You're always a king there. In my mind. Right. Yeah, in my mind. And so I get back in the streets and as I'm getting back into the streets, the drugs are not as accessible as they were before because the guy who I was messing with, he ends up going to the federal penitentiary. Yeah. So now I'm messing with all type of new guys, inconsistent. I still oh, got yeah. back, but I got LA habits. So LA habits are spend money like it's fucking going out of style. You yeah. are just with a guy who spends thousands every day. Yeah. So I'm still caught into that mind frame. Oh yeah. You'll tip a rich guy in LA. You'll be, <laughs> be a fucking rich dude. You'll give him 20. He'll be like, what the, I don't even want this. this is but, I, you, but you lose yeah. your fucking mind. Agreed. You lose your mind, right? And so I come here. I mean, I, so I get out there. The next thing you know, money's starting to slow up. So now I'm like, fuck it. I got to start robbing people now. Yeah. So now I'm robbing people. Damn, that's great. Right, right? And not to laugh, man. It's just <laughs> so wild, bro. It's fucking delusional, though. You know, I could have came back to LA, humbled myself, really talked to my guy and said, hey, man, I got to get my shit together. But my pride wouldn't allow me yeah. just to be where I was at, right? So next thing you know, I end up catching a uh, a robbery case in Columbus. And so 
I'm kicked out of college, kicked out of the NFL. I catch Did you run. do it? Were you the robber? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I got, got caught. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He and came I, up his yeah. shoulder pads. He ran a no. forward two. It was definitely him. You know. the, the, the bad, like, so like, I feel bad. Like, right. I, like, what is this? This is 2018 now. I feel fucking bad for doing it. Uh, but you Were know, you a good robber or not? I was, I was good into that point. But uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, but th th these are the, like, the irony of this. This is probably our first time saying this shit. There's the wrong people. So the, the the people who I was supposed to go and, oh, and rob, they weren't there. Oh, you an inaccurate robber, <laughs> and then, bro. <laughs> You're supposed to hit the A gap and you hit the, hit the B, B gap. gap. <laughs> That's what happened. So if the people listen, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> this is Theo laughing and not me. And, then, and I'm just laughing. Yeah. Uh, I'm laughing because I can laugh now at the pain. I can yes. see, you know, yes. it yeah. replaces it when you can laugh at it later. It replaces. You, you, you got that right. I, I don't know. I was. I was. Uh, yeah, you were different. I, I was out of my fucking mind. Out of your mind. Out of my mind. And so. Uh, what ended up, I ended up getting caught for that, and I was out on bond, but January 2006 to September, August when I got arrested, I was just out of my fucking mind, and you know I'm committing more crimes because I have no money, my, my lady's pregnant at this time, our oh. daughter's getting ready to be born, and I'm like, you know, you're going to the penitentiary. Man. And it's like the perfect storm. You ever seen that movie, The Perfect Storm, with the Andrea no. Gale? No. And uh, it's like the ship and everything. The ship. It's like it starts off it as a great plan, and then next thing you know, it's just trying to catch shrimp, and it's in the middle of like nine tidal waves and a typhoon. And you, it just you could probably call it that. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed like I can't even imagine that at yeah. twenty one. At twenty one, so just twenty one. Imagine having everything at the height of your life. You lose everything. Put this in context, right? After you lose everything, every decision that you make is fucking retarded. Yeah. When well, you fucking think about it, excuse my language, but it's, it's stupid. Yeah. And you fast forward. Yeah. It, everyone's ignorant at 21. Yes. Especially yeah. people that, you know, that if you don't have certain guidance or, you, or you're not really connected to the whatever guidance you have, you know? You, I think that's good. You're not connected to the guidance you have. I think that that was, uh, that would accurately describe me. And, and from there, nine months later, I ended up going to, um, uh, to get caught. I came down to Columbus. This is a real story. I tried to tell it to ESPN, but they didn't include it. And as I come down to Columbus, I get off on the wrong exit. This is about three in the morning. As I get off on the exit, I come to the, um, uh, uh, the stoplight and I make a U-turn in the middle of the road. So when I make the U-turn, there was a Home Depot parking lot and there was a police officer sitting in there. Ugh. Make the U-turn. I have an AK-47 on, on the pasture side, right? I'm out on bond. And as he comes up to me, I start thinking about this episode from Cops, right? Yeah. I have no fucking clue why. Bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm thinking to myself, when he walks up, I'm going to pull off. And from there, you know, uh, I get away. So he walks up on the car. And literally, I could see when he looked on the uh, passenger side, he see the fucking rifle. So he's like nervous as shit. I fucking speed off. He's running back to his car. And I'm coming over this uh, on his bridge on this uh, thing called Bryce Road. Mm -hmm. I get on the orange ramp. He's right behind me. Here's a, a, a real deal. I'm trying to get away in a Hyundai Santa Fe. Oh, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Hate hey, the getaway hectic, car. You know what I'm saying? That's hectic, boy. Yeah. And so uh, now, now the next thing you know, we're running down the freeway. And uh, we get about four or five miles down the road. And as I get further down the road, uh, you know, I'm from, I'm not from Louisiana, I'm from Youngstown, right? Yeah. We have fucking like buildings and shit. <laughs> I start to see the woods, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, brothers don't do no woods, right? Yeah, that's dangerous. <laughs> no, a lot that. of brothers end in the woods. Yeah, that's where it ends. Yeah. <laughs> Even on cops, yes, yes. even on cops, that's where cops ends. Yeah. Every time he's, it's in the woods. Absolutely. So let me turn my ass around. So I turn my ass around. The next thing you know, they had the uh, the, the fucking spike strips. They throw oh. out. They bust the that's tires. That's a cop out, bro. If I'm a cop, a real cop, dude. Get I'm out there and get shoot you. somebody. No, no. Don't lay the strips down. You know what I'm saying, bro? That's easy. That's like when they hire a dog to do the cop's job. Get out there and get your neck wet. Yeah. You hey, know? Well, when they when they got me, they got me. They caught you. Hit the strips. Yeah, I hit the strips. So it's like when they throw them, it, it, hopefully you'll never be in a situation you got to yeah. run. They, those fucking strips are like probably 40 yards long, man. Oh, wow. You throw them out there. They, well, probably 20. I, I would say a legitimate 20 yards. They throw them out there, and you can't even swerve to get around them. And uh, they busted the tires. And the next thing you know, I ended up um, getting pulled over, you know. and, and Easily uh, getting pulled over Easily getting pulled point. over at that point. <laughs> uh, and and uh, they took me out. They, they roughed me up, threw me in the back of the car. Um, you know, shit, and, and, and basically took me downtown. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, I, I call this like one of the, uh, I call it like my divine intervention moment. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I believe personally, had that not happened, 
I really believe, and, and I know people talk about it a lot, I can just see myself either going to prison for life mm -hmm. or being dead. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, because what's next after that? When you think about the scale of anything, mm -hmm. what's next after, you, you know, running from police and, and having guns? It's like, there's not much else after that. Bro, you just keep, you, you keep on pushing the proverbial uh, bar until you just fucking believe that shit doesn't stink anymore. And the next thing you know, you, you put yourself in a, in a horrible situation. And uh, I, Were you grateful, you think, when that happened yeah, a little bit? Listen, part listen of you? Me. I, get, I guarantee if you go talk to people in treatment, talk to people who got locked up, even though you don't want to admit it because it sounds crazy, mm -hmm. you're, gra you're glad that you're in a circumstance that you can't get in your way anymore. And that yeah. was my 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 exact feeling. I can't get away. I can't get in my way anymore because Thank God, I can't get in my way if, anymore. If if I do it, I'm gonna fuck it up. Yeah. I, I just don't have the discipline right now. And another thing that happened to me, I went to court that next week because I was a Wednesday. I went to court like that next Monday or some shit. The judge had mandated that I get that I get a mental health assessment. Mm -hmm. So I've been pushing away all this mental health assistance in college and the pros and all this other shit. She mandated I got it, and wow. I was suffering from anxiety and depression. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Finally get on mental health medication. My first uh, seven months of my incarceration, literally in a, in a room, probably about the third of the size, uh, a nine by four cell, you're locked down 23 hours out the day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Three pairs of drawers, three socks, three t-shirts, same toilet that you piss and shit in. It's the same shit that you drink water out of. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Literally. Basic. Basic shit. And uh, in that process, I call that like, you know, like, um, probably the most introspective awakening process of my life, you know? It was almost like a childhood or like an adolescence in a weird way. In because the, you're very limited. There's not much you can do. You can't really, you're safe in a way you can't really harm yourself. Great way to look at it. You know? Great way to look at it. You get a it. chance for your brain to just be patient for but, a minute. You know, you, know, you know what you do? You empty yourself. Because when, when you get caught, uh, and this is a real experience, and I've heard more people admit to it. You start to think about everything you've done wrong. Yeah. And you start to like cleanse your mind mm. of, of thoughts of things to put you in here, right? Uh, because there's nothing to distract you. You can't yeah. do anything to distract yourself. And uh, what ended up happening was like the greatest fucking thing. Um, all of that isolation, a guy, I, I, I will promote this book to the day I die. A guy dropped off a book, a small 70-page read called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Mm -hmm. The most impactful book I've ever read in my life, bar none, comparison to none, very simple. And um, I was asking myself, like, how did you get here, Reese? And after reading the book fucking 70 times in that situation, the book kept on showing me that thoughts were things mm. until thought is linked with purpose, nothing intelligent should ever happen. Until thought is linked with purpose, nothing intelligent should ever happen. I kept on thinking to myself, like, what the fuck does that mean at first, right? What a man thinks about, plants in his brain, plants in his mind, he shall manifest. Whatever yeah. he conceive, believe, and achieve, and speak up over, it shall come. It's so true, isn't it? Bro, so fucking true. So simple, though. Yeah. But when we grow up, we think, like, life is just a series of events, like, random shit happens, and you have no control over it. This game supreme control over me creating my life. Wow. And so I said, oh, I thought I was a gangster, so... I responded as a gangster. I talked as a gangster, but gangster shit has consequences within the American system. Well, you ended up as a gangster. You're running from the police. You got AKs on you, the seat. That's you, you get, were. You get everything that you want. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So then I'm transitioned to prison. At this time, I get seven and a half years. Yeah. Uh, now, when I take this medication, I'm stable. I'm calm. I'm cool. Like there's no anxiety. There's no like I got to get somewhere and go Something somewhere. Something that makes you go. Yeah. So, that's absolutely. Like a dirty motor. A dirty fucking motor. You can 100. You can label it that. I get to prison. There's a gentleman by the name of Mr. Calaconte, the warden of the prison. Beautiful guy. Talked a bunch, but he said, Maurice, my father was a chief of Sierra Leone for 15 years. Wow. He said, in Africa, he said, when guys would do something wrong, we would bring them closer to the village, figure out what's going wrong, help them out, fix them back up, and then send them back out. He said, in America, you all throw people away. He said, this is not over. I don't want to throw you away. So I'm like, all right, this is like, all right, cool. I've been in my fucking way this much, right? Next thing you know, he said, I want to put you in a bunch of psychological, social, and emotional supportive courses. Right. At this point, I never heard of shit. But for those who don't know, <laughs> it's therapy. You know, all he told me is like, you're going to therapy. Yeah. But guys in prison don't want to call it therapy. It's just you're going to classes. Right, 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 yeah. And so through the process of that, I start going to these fucking classes every day from like 8 in the morning till 12 in the afternoon. And could you, how educated were you at this point? And I not, not judging your education or anything, but like at this point, how were you? Like, could you read a book? No, and, and I was, I was going to get into that. No. Uh, so... I could read the words, but I probably couldn't comprehend. Right. Right. So my talent uh, allowed them to 
or I allowed myself to basically be pushed through school oh, since yeah. about tenth grade. Like me and Corey were laughing. I had a thirteen on my ACT, <laughs> and I cheated to get into college. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like just, just right. It was all the barriers weren't there. There was no. nothing to s tell you, hey, look. There was no mirrors really for you. It was just all just one way signs, kind of. As long as you can generate revenue on this football field, we'll find a way to get you to the football yeah. field. So, and then you never think it's going to win. You never think it's going to end. Of course not. You know what I'm saying? And so. Uh, we li we literally got done with that, but then uh, another thing happened after I was doing that. Uh, I didn't realize that that same motivation that I had to be a great football player was the same. Like that was an energy that was inside of me, just wanted to do something phenomenal, right? Right. So I said, okay. Oh, that's a great. I was going to ask you about this. Yeah. So I said, what do you do when you want to be good in football? You go watch film from people you want to be like. So I said, okay, I want to be a businessman because there were so many entrepreneurial things that drug dealing had gave me. Mm -hmm. I always say crime in its inception is entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. I want to take control of my own destiny. Oh yeah, drug dealer. People always look at a drug dealer like a bad guy. I'm like, that's a bit. That man is a businessman. Wrong product. Right. Wrong. Yeah, bad product. B bad product. But but it's a. But he's the businessman. He sources product. He sells. He retains customers. He gives consignment. He work with logistics. <laughs> it's really true. You, you, you can capital allocation. We can go on and on yeah, and on. Agree. Uh, but but that's what he does. And so I said, okay, let me formally teach myself about this. So I start educating myself and reading and reading. So I used to go to commissary, and when people would send me money, twenty thirty dollars here. I would start to get legal pads and I would right. start to do book reports and just read from people, read from people, read from people, read Entrepreneur, Incorporated, Fast Company, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. And and how are you feeling at this point? Like, are you like, I mean, are you th still thinking about football at this point? Are, are you, no. So at, at that time I was 22 and I had seven and a half years would have put me out of prison. I'd have been 30 years old. So at that point, I'm like, you know, I'll never play football again. And so I was just anxious to learn something else that I can take care of myself with. Right. And so through reading, I was just like, yo, there's a fucking big world out here. You can be, you can be successful. In anything you want. Anything you want. So, and if you ever hear me talk, I always talk about fucking reading changed my life. Nothing yeah. else. Reading changed my life. It just opened my eyes up to what was possible, what you can do, how you can create your world, how you can take that same work ethic and, place it elsewhere and what about your child at this point is your baby born yet yeah so she's born and and uh and, and she can't see her you can see her during visitations so what would happen is that uh you know every probably three months and i stopped them from coming uh because it was easier to live the life prison as if they didn't exist oh wow so you, and did you tell your wife about that or yeah, you tell your, yes, you told her yes. that so it, it, it became hard so if you came to see me it will remind me of what i was missing oh wow so if I see you, I got to see like, fuck, this is a whole child. She's around me. I mean, she's around me in the moment. I'm visiting my emotions that I cut off in prison. This shit is like for real. You know what I'm saying? Like, what the fuck am I doing? You start to beat yourself up. Is that a common practice for people that are inmates sometimes or people that you, are incarcerated? You, no, you, you have two different extremes. Some guys like a ton of visits because they like to live in the outside world. Right. right? So, you know, prison is like... Prison, I always say, is the most intense environment you can ever be in. You know what I'm saying? So just think about this, right? And there's no women in there. It's all men? The, the, the guard women. The, the, the guards are women sometimes. You know what oh, I'm saying? Oh, that's got to be, the, that's got to even be worse. <laughs> yeah. Like, damn, I can't even get a woman. And then this, <laughs> this one's making me go to bed. Yeah, man. Just, <laughs> you know, it's fucking nuts, man. Just just imagine, like, six o'clock in the morning. So, first of all, the lights never go out. Oh. Just imagine this. Now, you, you, I used to have a roommate in college that wouldn't turn the lights out, dude, and it fucking pissed me off, bro. So, you'll be pissed off in this prison. This dude, Lester, yeah. <laughs> if fucking Lester's out there, they call him Lit Up Lester, bro. <laughs> Lit this up Lester. This dude was fluorescent as fuck. Bulbs all day, bro. Bulb, 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 bulbs. The dude love light bulbs on. All day. He'd walk in any room and he wasn't even in the room and just turn on the fucking lights and roll out. Like, <laughs> fuck him. Flashlight. Yeah, there was something riding in his head. If he had lights on, it made him feel comfortable. So he would cut them on everywhere he went, man. And fuck you, Lester, bro. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, he's a nice kid, but he wasted a lot of money around America with all this oh, wattage. Lights, yeah. oh, erroneous wattage, bro. Well, well prison, prison is wasting a lot of money. Oh. And they keep the fucking lights on all day. But just could, could you imagine six in the morning, you have to be like it's game day every day. You know, it's fucking <laughs> nuts, bro. It's not game you know day what I'm saying? Either, it's yeah. but it's game day, you know, right. God, like just and, and we're we're not talking about like sporadic events. You're talking about on a consistent basis, guys getting their ass kicked at six in the morning. Yeah. You know, you we got into it at recreation last night. We go on a child, you get your ass kicked on the way to child. You know, you talking about motherfuckers getting, you know, uh, fucking baby oil and, t and hot water thrown in their face over fucking card games. You talking about motherfuckers just 
intense environment all day. The, what were some things that you liked about it? Well, the, the one thing you like about prison is the respect factor. And so in society, if I disrespect you or you disrespect me, we can like walk away, you know, or, or, or hire or, lawyers, or, or bunch hire, of bullshit. We, we can do other things. In prison, it is the ultimate punishment fast. So there's not no, there's no lying. There's no talking behind people's back. There's no people bullshitting you. Wow. There's no stealing if you can't like defend yourself or taking what you want from people. Uh, there's no gossiping. There's none of that. And everything has a serious demeanor. People in prison literally don't look at each other, right? So I can remember, like, for four years, walking through prison, like, you don't look at people. Because you don't want to show your cards. Your cards are in your eyes. If we don't talk to each other, we don't have no business with each other. We don't need to look at each other. We don't need to speak to each other. So there's a there's an organ there's there's a, a sense of organization in prison. Very there, fascinating. There's a sense of discipline within the within the element or within the environment, right? right? Did you have altercations in prison or no? Yeah, just over, but over bullshit, over um, the washer. You know, mm -hmm. so you just think about this, right? So you have a washer and this is a serious thing. Like if you allow somebody to skip you online to wash your clothes, it can be perceived wrong. Mm -hmm. You have arguments over the microwave. These are serious things. Have arguments over a basketball game, right? Mm -hmm. And so this forces you to defend like your space. And so prison, everybody's trying to just imagine you're in a neighborhood and all the sales are houses. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to state claim as to who they are in that neighborhood. Yeah. And it's either you're with the guys, you're with the populace, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the majority, either be with the Bloods, Crips, uh, Mexican <laughs> guys, you know, or uh, guys who are uh, within a white gang. And there's, there's many different factions. But Ooh. there's there, you have all of that within one housing unit. And so for everybody to coincide, there has to be an extreme amount yeah. of respect amongst each other. This is every day, bro. Every day. You only have three telephones. It's not like Monopoly, but with knives, bro. It sounds fucking intense, you so, know? So you just imagine that. So I've learned, click, I've learned quickly when I'm here, this ain't my program. Right. Like, this ain't my deal. Like, you know, I, what I did in the streets and what the consequences were, like, yo, this, this is not you. Like, and so I had to admit that to myself that... I'm not ready to die here. Right. You know, so I'm not ready to fight over a fucking microwave. I'm not ready to well, I'm not ready to die over a microwave. Right. I'm not ready to die over disrespect in prison. Like it's just not this is not my environment. And so you have guys like literally who are fucking nuts. And I can call it for what it is. These guys are fucking nuts. Guys who are never going home. So Right. They got nothing to lose. My sentence is seven and a half years. So my circumstances aren't like yours because the average person in prison who I was at, these guys are doing fifteen years or better. So the way they look at what's going on, the way I look at what's going on is two different things. Right. So I said, Reese, your program is to get your ass in here, read, educate yourself, figure out what you're going to do and get the fuck out of here. And That's what I did. And, and and at this point, when you get out, who's still there that was there whenever, like are any of the celebrities and the stars, is any no. of that still? No. So um, I, I give it to Mike Tomlin, uh, the coach for uh, Pittsburgh Oh, yeah, Pittsburgh, Steelers. yeah. He reached out and wrote me a letter, which is beautiful because I'm like, you know, you guys are fucking, at that time they had won the Super Bowl. And for you to think about Maurice Claret in fucking prison, who've never, I didn't go to NFL run for yards, I thought, which was uh, great. Um, and literally that was it, you know, but you know, it's, um, you start to look at it different because you start to look at life as, you know, um, these people don't owe me anything. They don't owe me the personal connection. And you start to realize that your friendships are just circumstantial. Right. You know, as long as you're that guy entertaining or you have a certain status amongst peers, people would love to be associated with you. Right. But when you're not that guy anymore, like there was never a human connection or a human part to that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so I can't say it was the same in all cases, but you're not a factor. You don't help me get pussy. You don't help me get in the club. You don't help me get uh, an endorsement deal. You don't help me to do that. So... We don't hold any value. And, right. and the only people I had in my corner, like outside of anybody, was just my mother, my lady, uh, my daughter, and that was it, bro. It, you know, I, I just called it for what it is. That was it. Yeah. And so when uh, when I got out of prison, you know, fuck, I had 400 bucks. You know what I'm saying? And I have I had bunches of people who were- And what was your attitude like? Because would you, I mean, because you had had, <clears throat> I mean, fiscally, maybe you, who knows what you had and like you're, you know, but you were at- I mean, just, yeah, you were at this superficial level of a billionaire. I mean, you were a superficial billionaire. Not, yeah, superficial, yes. Right, like not you personally, but the, you know, the the environment inside, yeah, in your psyche. It's like you think you're a billionaire. Yeah, bro, it's, it's, it, let me tell you like this. It was very fucking humbling, you know, and... Um, and what kept you, like, going at that point at those moments, like... But to, to know, after from reading from people so many success stories... 
there wasn't a shadow of a doubt. Like, so if you talk to me long enough, I, even outside of this, you'll see I got a, a shit ton of confidence. Mm -hmm. I just believe like anything I attach myself to or put my, put my focus on and I just really focus on, I feel like I can have success. You're going to do well with it. I, I, yeah. There's not a shadow of a doubt. Um, I don't even worry, like weary. It's or, always been in you. That's always been in you. So even from football to whatever I do, I just feel like if I focus on something, I can figure it out. So I had read so many success stories and just the process of it. And I'm very disciplined. I got a fucking crazy work ethic. These are things that I just know I can control, right? Yeah. And so I knew I would be successful in something. And, and the thing I wanted to be successful in initially was senior care services. Yeah. And this happened from, I used to have eight ladies. I used to call them my golden girls. Uh -huh. <laughs> These are old ladies who said, we identify with people who are incarcerated because as our children grow up, they forget about us. Oh, wow. And they start to live their families. They start to like live their lives. It's a huge problem in America. A lot of senior citizens are really forgotten about. A lot of men up in homes where they're not being cared for pro Boom. appropriately. So I had people who told me that. And so they said, these are just real needs. So they all said this, but they weren't from one place. They were just Ohio State fans. Right. And Maurice Claret fans, right? As so I said, man, this would be a cool deal to learn it, to understand it, but to provide care, transportation, and so on and so forth. That was the initial thing, but from seeing so much success or reading from so much success, I was like, I can actually do this. Mm. And that was my motivation. I just was like, I'll put myself together at some point. And so I ended up getting out of prison in 2010, and uh, I had an opportunity uh, to play football for a minor league team in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Great fucking city, uh, if anybody's never been to Omaha. And so I went out to Omaha, and I thought that Omaha was going to be like full of just fucking cornfields and everything else, and it wasn't. And it was some of the most down-to-earth American. People, huh? It's the most American place that you can fucking name. And from small businesses to people who are fucking millionaires, billionaires driving pickup trucks, simple, everyday shit from people who were so successful. But what Omaha also allowed me to do was to adjust slowly. Mm. So I got out here. I was able to play football, go to the gym, come home, talk to my family, and just do like simple shit. Some safe regiment in a safe environment. A safe regiment. But I also, I, also, I also talk about this. Like This is one of the greatest experiences in Omaha, aside from playing football. When I was in prison, I had read so much uh, from Warren Buffett fucking shit tons of information when i went to omaha I knew warren buffett was out there and things like that right mm -hmm. so uh our coach ended up being this guy by the name of joe moglia joe moglia had made probably 400 million dollars he ended up leaving as the active ceo of CD td ameritrade he ended up becoming the um uh, the chairman of the board mm -hmm. so out of all things he wanted to do he wanted to get back into coaching football he ended up coming back to be the head coach of our team so every wednesday he would tell guys like hey if you have anything that you want to ask financially Come and meet me on Wednesdays. Oh, wow. Out of everybody, only two of us showed up, right, every week. So he said, fuck that. I'm not about to keep on making this available. The guys had no fucking clue of what he was offering. Valuable information from a motherfucking Titan, right? right? So he said, Maurice, come to the golf course with me. I'm like, yo, bro, I can't play golf. You know what I'm saying? He said, just come to the golf course. <laughs> tell me a story. How the fuck did you go from prison to ended up here? So I told him a whole story after I'm done. He said, I've never asked Warren for a favor in my life. Let me see if I can call Warren Buffett and get him to meet you. So I'm thinking to myself, like, motherfucker, I'm 18 months released from prison. <laughs> like, this motherfucker ain't about to meet with my black ass. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So <laughs> I walk into my apartment and uh, serious shit. <laughs> yeah, you know it's true, right? <laughs> well, this shit's funny, man. So you he's like, yeah, Warren Buffett ain't fucking about to meet my black ass, right? <laughs> so uh, I walk through the fucking uh, the joint. I'm walking through the apartment. He hit my phone up. He's like, Maurice. He said, uh, you know, this is Warren. And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, because uh, and, and I, I remember his voice distinctly because I used to watch Charlie Rose in prison. I used to watch his motherfucking interview everybody, right? <laughs> and so yeah, Charlie Rose, my man, right? Minus the allegations, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I don't, I, I'm not convicting my man. It, it is what it is, right? Yeah. And so... Um, <laughs> So we end up, um, I end up going, right? I end up calling him, right? Or he ended up calling me. I'm talking to him on the phone. And he like, yo, you got anything I'm going to do on Saturday? I'm like, yo, whatever going on Saturday is canceled. Don't even yeah. worry about that, right? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm getting my shit together. I go to TJ Maxx at the time. I get like my fucking outfit. I think like it's the best thing. You know, I'm broke as shit. So I go over to his house. Or I go over to his office. And ironically, the person who had a meeting before him had canceled. And he was like, yo, do you want to hang out? And I'm like, you serious? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, you want to hang out? So we sitting there one-on-one -on -one for five hours, right? No. 
And so I'm asking to do everything I ever like fucking dreamed of. And uh, it was like cool shit that happened. Was he preaching at you or was he cool to talk to? Was he- dude, this dude, so he reads a fucking ton. So it's easy for him to have a thoughtful, intellectual, personal conversation. This was Saturday. This dude is more fucking humble and down to earth than anybody I've ever fucking met. Right, this dude controls fucking a, a shit ton of our oh, world. Yeah. Did you think about even asking him for like a million? I would have yeah, asked. Yeah, him for, for a million. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have called it a small million. Let me get a small, small million. million. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm telling this dude was just like he was like fucking. He was he was zoned in. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And uh, and so the next thing you know, we end up meeting and, and getting together. And uh, I had in the, I, I ended the meeting and, and fucking was like, yo, I know you got better shit to do than talk to me. Right? You right. fucking run the world. And uh, the next thing you know, I rolled out to um. Excuse me, I rolled about rolled out back home. Uh, a few months after that, ESPN had reached out to me and they said, "Hey, can we do a thirty for thirty on your life?" Yeah, I saw and, it. Um, and and after that, uh, it took about eight months to shoot the show. And uh, I woke up one day after the show came out and I had eleven hundred. Uh, and I remember literally eleven hundred emails mm-hmm. uh, from people just either talking and, and and asking to come and speak. I didn't never, I've never done public speaking prior to that. And I end up uh, just going on the road and starting to tell my story and ask questions and answer questions. And um, from there, I end up getting into the transportation business because I got tired of, uh, it literally felt as I was traveling, and I'm pretty sure anybody who's traveled a lot, you can feel lonely. Mm-hmm. As, as cool as it may look to the outside. Oh, it's lonely. You, you're in a hotel by yourself. You go, uh, you're a spectacle once you get on stage. Yeah. After you get off stage, you're taking a picture, you're talking hands, and next thing you know, you're thinking about what other city you're going to next. Right. And so I had done about 350 speaking engagements in three years, which is a fuck ton. You That's know what I'm saying? That's a lot, yeah. After a while, I feel like you're just repeating words. And I was like, okay, let me get into another business uh, because I don't want to depend on this my whole life. Like, I can't force somebody to book me for an engagement, right? Right. And so from there, I ended up getting into transportation. And after transportation was uh, uh, doing what it did for a couple of years, I ended up um, going to an event uh, in Ohio. And I was I was doing the event. And through the process of doing the event, the event had ended. And uh, there was a person, a gentleman who had been teaching uh, some young men who were about like 17 or 18 years old, some of the work that we had done in prison. And, and I was like, yo, my man, like, where did you get this stuff from? It was cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. It was an exercise with the activating event, the mind activity, the body reaction, the consequence. And this was stuff that I had helped to facilitate in prison. Wow. Right? It's one of the things they teach you in licensed clinical social work. It's one of the things they teach in the first year. It's like one of the CBT. CBT. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, what ended up happening was that uh, I just like enjoying what he was talking about. I was like, you know, what do you do? And he was like, you know, I run a behavioral health agency. And I said, what the fuck is a behavior health agency? He was like, I work with mental health and drug and alcohol. And for me having so many issues with drugs You're and like, alcohol. You're like, this is my, yeah, boom, this is my home. This is my home. But even going through that work in prison, I felt that out of everything that was helping to re- rehabilitate guys, the actual work, the social work, right, the therapeutic services were the things that guys would come back to the block and talk about and have intellectual discussions or guys would become revealing about themselves mm. in a therapeutic format. And I thought to myself, like more kids in the inner city need to basically be in, be involved and connected with this. Right. So I went through uh, like an eight month process of policies and procedures. We go through that whole uh, deal and the process of doing that. I end up opening up our company called The Red Zone. And at first we went back to literally inner cities. And I thought that um, there was so much emotionally. Like I'm just thinking about to my childhood. Uh, the amount of murders I had seen, the yeah. amount of domestic violence and robberies, and just the amount of trauma that I had been experiencing that I never processed. Right. I never emotionally got over it. Right. I, I was functioning from like a space of fear or where the drugs and alcohol masked like some of my childhood shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you keep it inside of you. And did you, you your father wasn't present when you were growing up? No, you know, so I was born in 83 and my mother divorced in 84. I see, yeah. And so... Um, like my mother never down talked him or or made him out to be a bad person, but just through their disconnect, like yeah. there just wasn't any male involvement. And so my mother uh, worked as a second year educational coordinator at a medical school, so she worked forty five minutes away. So as oh, a result yeah. from that, You're the home kids come home. Home alone a lot. Yeah. So now the neighborhood and the environment raises you. Starts to raise you, yeah. And so how I found, I mean, obviously I've known about you, right? Okay. And I, a lot of people, like when I said Maurice Claret's going to come on the podcast, you know, I, I listen to his podcast, Business and Biceps, you and uh, Corey and John. Mm-hmm. And it's um, it's a great hang. It's like, uh, if it, you know, if I recommend checking out their podcast because it's a fun, it's like... I don't know what it is. I can't feel like if, I can't tell if I feel like I'm at the gym or the office 
or the <laughs> therapist. That's what I can't tell when, but that's what I like about but, it. But I'm glad you feel that because that's the intention. <laughs> and it's exactly what I feel. It's like there's moments where it's like, okay, this is uplifting and this is inspiring. Um, and then there's moments where it's like, uh, it's just guys like joking around. It feels like a fantasy football league. And then it's there's moments where it's like, um, you know, the other day you guys were talking about uh, loyalty and stuff like that. And even if I don't resonate with everything that's said on the podcast, and we're going to have uh, Corey and John in in just a mm -hmm. few minutes, um, even if I don't resonate with everything, there's just every now and then there's a, it makes me think of something like, oh, loyalty mm -hmm. makes me just hearing about loyalty makes me think, oh, well, you know, let me think back into my life. Loyalty. If I were to go back and make a list of who's been loyal to me in my life, it's just, you know, it's fun to hear. Um, just things that you hear, you're then inspired to think about, you yeah, know? But, but I think one of the biggest things, we talked about this last night at dinner, and what the focal point even is just to bring, like, real things that you feel. Yeah. And I'm a real big feel person, right? Yeah, yeah. If you, if you don't feel it as you're saying it, it's not real. It's yeah. like entertainment, right? And and when we talk about business and you talk about growing business, um, from, from, from our business standpoint, we try to talk about things that are actually real and not like the cute pictures and videos and bullshit bitch music on Instagram that like misleads kids. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because, oh, 100%, especially young kids. Yes, but you, you and so you can be misled. And so if you've given me your time a fucking hour, just think about this, right? So people are giving you an hour of their fucking day or 40 minutes or 30 minutes or however long the format is, right? You kind of owe it to them if they believe in you and they're giving you ear to be thoughtful and pure with your entertainment yeah. and to give a message that's real. Yeah. And so that way, like at, at, at the core of us, I heard Denzel say this on um, Charlie Rose. He said, from the specific comes the universal. So if you can connect to yourself and get down to specific emotion, I'm pretty sure that may work in comedy, mm -hmm. right? You're yes. drawing from something. I, yeah. don't, I don't give a fuck like, you're drawing from something. That's how it connects to people because people are like, oh, I feel that. I can laugh from it, right? Yeah. This, this connects somewhere. And so the podcast is a format of things that like uh, I've actually been through, things that we actually experienced. Yeah. And, 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 and having a level of entertainment that doesn't seem cheesy, phony, or like commercial. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, that, and that, but, but that's real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and so... Like you have, uh, you also have an element to where people who have come from humble beginnings, you know what I'm saying? Corey literally comes from the trailer parks. John comes from a poor background in Chicago, yeah. you know, very, I come from the hood in fucking Youngstown. Yeah. And it's a great voice that's out there. I mean, that's one of the things that I really like about, uh, about you guys cast is that, yeah, it connects like it's the Midwest, you know, it's yes. hardworking, um, you know, our producer Nick is from uh, Wisconsin. It's like, and he's one of the hardest workers I know. It's like, you know, it's a voice that's that's not out there as much these days, I feel like, no. um, or that you can't find on the coast anyway. And so it's, you know, that's what I really love listening about it. Um, I got a couple more questions for you, and then we're going to uh, we're gonna take a break for a few minutes and get Corey and John in here. Gotcha. And we're going to do another hour with the guys. Um, and some, some listener questions as well. We oh, yeah, we got some listeners up? and questions oh, as well. Cool. I just want to ask you this. Do you... Do you feel like, uh, do you feel like you were always going to be, do you feel like if football was supposed to be your thing or do you feel like that you were always going to be good at something? I don't know if that's a wild question or not. No, it's not. Um, I don't think when I was young, I, th I think football when I was young was a way to, uh, fit in and grab friends. Right. Yeah. I think, um, I didn't necessarily like football. I like to work hard. Right. And um, I also looked at football as a vehicle to get out of my situation. Right. But I didn't love football. Didn't love it at all. Uh, I love the element of competing, but not football yeah. as much as that. And uh, the older I got, and I started to realize the, the the science of working hard and understanding what you're working towards and being clear at, at that, I have a, a confidence, not to sound arrogant, but I believe no. that You've I can it. be- I can be successful at, yeah. at whatever it is I choose to put my attention to. And so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, I, I still feel like I'll be uh, great at something because I know how to just like connect with my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I know anything that I be, may be connected to will be connected to what's real and, and not even a commercial success. Like, you know, uh, I'll be successful just because I, I'll be doing shit that makes me happy. This right. makes me ha like as corny and cliche as it may sound, but this like sitting down makes me happy. Yeah. Talking to you. Oh, I can tell, man. Look, when I was uh, watching 30 for 30, I mean, I was, uh, I mean, I was teared up at one point, like just seeing you like, you know, you could just kind of tell, um, 
I don't know, just that you were just a really deep person emotionally, you know? Yeah. And that, and, and I, I'm that, I'm that same way. You know, and I notice when I'm growing up, if I didn't have like somebody to tell me that it was okay to be that way, then it's like I was always didn't know what was going on with my emotions, you know? Absolutely. And so then you have this whole life where you have these emotions, but you don't know if it's even okay to think about them or how to feel or. So, but, but just imagine you pioneering a space for that to be cool. Right. Yes. Right. So, so now if I look up to you, if I look up to Maurice, I look up to anybody. Now this guy talking about it now, like this is a real thing. Yeah. Now this is it, cool to be indifferent about my emotions. It's cool to be not cool, but being sad is normal. Being confused is normal. Having anxiety is normal. Right. Uh, feeling indifferent about different things. Like, and, and so even as you say that, it just, it just affirms and gives confirmation that that's the road I keep on needing to travel because there's more people who fucking putting your voice in the ear on a consistent basis who needs that. And, yeah. and and that helps them to heal or to be whole as they're moving forward. Oh, it's a good, it's an amazing gift, man. I mean, it's, I, I think you have that. I th really feel like you have that gift, like to a remarkable level of anybody that I've, you know, listened to or heard or, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I have this, why, like you just have an uncanny ability, um, to iterate comfortably to others, um, like kind of how you feel and then also how it kind of fits into what you're doing though, yeah. you know? Um, Cause sometimes it's so hard to connect those two, you yes. know, it's so hard to connect those two and still stay confident in it and moving forward, you know? Oh, I get it. I yeah. get it. But I, I don't know. Um, Do you feel like that's a blessing? Do you feel like that's a learned thing? Yeah. I don't, I think it's an learn from experience, uh, but I believe it's a blessing because it, it allows me to walk as a whole person everywhere I go. Yeah. And I don't have to bring a representative. I don't have to, um, like I get to, I get, I get to be me, you know, like, like, um, if I would, if I would have did this podcast 10 years ago, I would have said, man, I care about my jeans, what my shoes going to look like. Yeah. I got on a five dollar red red hot chili pepper shirt on. I don't even know who they are. You know what I'm saying? But I like the shirt. You know what I'm saying? No, um, he thought it's from maybe yeah. a farmer's market. No, yeah. I got on thirty dollar Levi's. And we got red hot chili peppers right here. That's ironic. We just got this plant. Yeah. Um, you feel I'm coming from? No, I feel you. And I don't. This is I honestly. This is the most dressed up I've got because I, honestly, I was so excited about you guys coming in. Oh, there. I appreciate. It. Well, I yeah. appreciate it, but I feel. I, yeah, I just feel. Yeah, like I, I I listen to you, and I feel like you really embody a lot of what we want you know like what we try to do here you know we got a lot a lot of our listeners are young men that have struggled you know and that gotcha. you know have struggled to you know being raised by single parents that sort of thing and um and yeah i'm just i'm glad that to be able to help turn some of our listeners on you guys podcast because i think that there's a you know you guys have a wealth of knowledge in a fun way um and emotional knowledge to offer people man gotcha. no I, I, I even so they gave me when they told me who you were before i purposely did not look at you because I said, okay, I looked at something on IG and I said, okay, I don't want to form an opinion of somebody. Yeah. And then, but because you want to like, you want to go and have like the natural energy of something. And even through talking, you could tell if something is forced, you can tell the energy and you can tell if it isn't right. But when I was on the plane yesterday, I was coming down, I don't know where the fuck we were at, but I said, man, everything feels right. Right. And so, you know, how this stuff feels right. Yeah. Like my relationship. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Things feel right, but not only feel right. Um, and, you know, we talked about this at dinner, like, I know why they feel right. And I know how you can push the gas for things to get better than what they are, but better what they are. And um, if anybody like has ever felt that feeling, that's like a beautiful feeling to have. Yeah. And uh, to know you yourself, I'm not drinking, drugging, I'm not fucking being uh, 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 bad towards my woman. I'm not right. fucking sleeping around. Uh, I I'm great to the guys and we have a good relationship. It's powerful, huh? You feel I'm coming from? And, yeah. and the stuff that we're talking about is stuff that you can like actually say, this is what I do. And the preservation of that in a, in a society right now, um, where so much is driven off side of, uh, let me look cool and yeah. let me promote what's fake. I think that even you, we owe it to people to provide platforms to be like, okay, like humanity still does exist. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? Right. That's a, no, I get that. Uh, there's something about you. You don't see, you almost defame you don't like to be the center of attention in a weird no, way no, or you cool. get, or the fee, the way it makes you feel doesn't land super well inside of you. No, it might like this. The center of attention is too much, uh, it's too much responsibility, my man, you know, and, 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 um, I would be the center of attention if it was simple. Right. You know, and, and that thing. But sometimes. But a lot comes with the center of attention. Yeah, because you're whoring out. 
Yeah. You know, so you, yeah. you, you become a whore and you can get involved in things that financially make sense or look cool, but just may not be you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And I, I don't want to be anybody's whore. I don't want to be a product whore. I don't want to be a system whore. I don't want to be standing next to people. If I really don't like you and I really don't believe what you value, I really don't want to be around you. Like, and not from a hateful standpoint. Right. I just don't want to affiliate my being with your being. Right. And, um, it's bad magnets right there. Yeah, but but I think that but but that comes back to understanding why I love myself and I love myself from like I do right by my family. Who do you, can you feel you can you feel is it easier to feel love now as an adult than it was when you were young? 100%. 100%, but I but I think I think it starts with self though. You know, cuz now I love myself and I know who really loves me and um and and I can I can just tell like is this a working relationship? Is this a you need something? I can identify that clearly now. Right. And um and, and it is is beautiful to have uh somebody to love you for you. I'm talking about my woman, I'm talking about my mother, I'm talking about my daughter, I'm even talking about with Corey and John. Uh, and I think that, uh, like I, I can give you one thing about John, right? So, um, and this is John Fosco John and he'll Fosco. be in here in just a couple yeah. minutes. I know they're chomping and they bet they're watching on the yeah. live feed. So just think about this, right? So we were getting ready to do a show that were, that was revolved around sports. Mm -hmm. And then John goes and watches, um, he watches the 30 for 30. Mm -hmm. And after he watches the 30 for 30, the sporting show that we were going to do was a little bit more hardcore and language was foul and all this other shit, right? And so after watching the show, he had come back to Corey and said, yo, I don't really think that that's direction that serves him well mm. to put him in that light based upon the amount of kids and people that he deals with. Yeah. And so to have that uh, amount of consideration right. uh, in doing that. So Corey knew me already. And me and Corey have been buddies fucking eight, nine, ten years or however long we've known each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so Corey already had like a level of like, you know, our connection. But for John to step in and do that without even knowing me. Right. To recognize like, that in advance. To recognize see the in value. advance. Yes. And um it just it just spoke to a lot about that. So like you kind of know who you're around. Yeah. Or you know what like what's up with the people around you. So when you can do that and you can fucking sit and have a good meal and you can talk and you can bullshit and when you get to the airport, you're laughing like little kids because you're happy that it feels like a team is going somewhere yeah. to do something. That's fun, huh? Bro, it's like- That's what you miss probably most about the sports, bro, I bet. The camaraderie. Me, there's nothing like it. The brotherhood. The, the, bro, bro, there's nothing like you and a group of guys who have a common interest and you all working towards something and shit's starting to go right and you're figuring shit out and you're having fun. Team. And you you get in, think about this, you're getting energized off of ideas. Yeah. Oh like, yeah. That, that's not the that's not the cool fucking Bentley and the cute music and all the bullshit filters. Like you're getting inspired from talking about an idea and like what this could become. That's like fucking dreaming. That's like, you know, yeah. that, that has nothing to do with nothing else other than creative thought. It, it doesn't have to do with women and fucking fake titties and ass shots and all that stupid <laughs> shit. Like, you know, there, there's a- It's real. It, it, there's a, like, just, just think about how you may get excited about somebody who may comes onto your show, you're thinking, where could this go? Who could we affect? How would they receive this? What are comments looking like? Did I give my all to the show? That is beautiful, bro. Oh, it's a feel, it's a real feel. It's visceral. You yes. get it in your body, in your chest. It runs up my neck. I can feel when when things are when it's real. But, you know. And then when you're done, you like this is work well done. You go to sleep satisfied. Yes, because you're not cheating anybody. You're not. You're you're putting something good out into the world. You're being rewarded for it. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, it's a, it is a really different and comfortable way to to sleep. Um, yeah, I remember when I would go into AA meetings. One of the mm -hmm. best times I ever had and still have are. I remember sitting down between two guys that I knew in meetings, from meetings, and I sat there, and they were both laughing, we were joking around, and I was like, man, this is interesting, all I really wanted, and I was just started tearing up, I was like, all I wanted my whole life, really, was just to sit around and joke with, with, with guys, and I've been wow. chasing these other things that have maybe tried to feel, feel whatever this little feeling is right here, just to be in a little group, and have fun, you know? Like wow. I've been chasing this, you know, or, you know, you think about other stuff or do other things. Like you're saying, you go after like the shiny trinkets, you know, but you, but I was like, man, it just, I don't know, just have some sort of a little bit of a brotherhood. I, I, was, about to, I was about to ask, past the brotherhood, what is it else that you think that you're getting from that moment? Um, It was nice to know that these people cared about me because we'd all agreed to meet there mm -hmm. and we all showed up. And so like they cared, you know, and I knew they cared about me. And so that made me feel, when I knew somebody else cared about me, 
it made me feel good. Right, so, so, so did did it did it? Um, and and it, this is one thing I like about meetings, right? It allows me to comfortably put my vulnerabilities in front of people. Yeah. If I'm coming from, oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Oh yeah, I know I could talk to them and say anything to them, yes. but I don't know. There was just something about being flanked by two people that I knew were like were like almost like brothers, you know. Yes. It just felt uh like a child, like love. Yes, that's what it yeah. felt like. It felt like something that I never really had that I've been wanting my whole life. So I guess the question, like, so when we see people or, or more people, mm -hmm. you know, because like, like I always say it, man, like. You weren't birthed out of your mother's pussy to become an abuser of drugs or alcoholic, right. you know, and you're chasing a feeling. Right. That's why I'm real big into feel. Yeah, that's what I'm into, right? man. And that's one that when I saw, I was just like, man, we I, I would we have got to have Maurice Claret in. I'm just so excited. And uh, and then when I got turned on to the podcast even more, I'm like, oh, this is great. This is a this is like a fun, goofy, educational, mm -hmm. but also heartfelt place where I can hang out. Um, let's get the guys in here, and then we'll go to the video questions and do that then. Okay, That'll they're pretty Maurice fun. specific. They are. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's let's rattle off one or two. We'll just make it a long episode. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was. I. I emailed those guys i was like we'll still do a full hour with you if oh we, yeah if you, definitely if you got no place to go and we have nothing to do oh yeah yeah so great so we're not going to be cutting it short at all i have a couple quick ones okay. uh when you had your cops uh chase yes i might have gotten some bad intel did you have a katana in the car a katana what is a, a blade katana? like a blade a big sword oh no i had a no a no, samurai no sword? you had a bad information no <laughs> 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 gotta ask great question <laughs> no so the, here is the thing there was a hatchet in the car yeah. already. Oh, so, sure. Yeah, this, 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 no, so it was like a fucking, it was like a, um, it was like a, a, a fucking, you know, like a, a meat cleaver. <laughs> Damn, dude. Where you borrowing cars from, man? Hey, Paul was, Bunyan dealership? No, it was my, it was my uncle's car. He had yeah. like a fucking, uh, like a little tool that he used for the yard. I, I, I did have four guns though. I have four, yeah. I have four guns. Yeah, you weren't going to need the hatchet. Those no, are, I didn't need a hatchet. No. That, that's a more logical weapon. The, that's the a gun. more logical. Yeah. Uh, but, and, here's a here's a oh and one more in prison you, before you realize that like that wasn't for you and you were talking about their scuffles all the time like i'm sure there's gangs and stuff but were people fucking with you because most i'm sure one on oh, one so, so no there was there was like michigan yeah, fans no <laughs> no nah, nah, there, there was no there, there was shit talking but then prison is also a, 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 an environment that is very clear it's either you're into the shit or you out of the shit right and it was clear that i was out of the shit you know what I'm saying? And so uh, even as you walk around, I'm not being boastful for myself, but there's a lot of tough guys in prison, but I'm not a bitch myself. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so you walk around with a demeanor and your demeanor is like, whatever is whatever. You know, rather motherfucker want to fight, rather you want to do whatever. And so guys can feel it on you. You know, it's an aura. Like, And you didn't have it. Nah, you weren't I mean, carrying I'm, it. I'm not a chump. You know what I'm saying? Right. On any level, but I'm not the toughest guy in prison. And I, and I humbly say that because there's a anybody you know who really runs the prisons are mexicans you know mexicans the mexicans guy, run america these days the, the guy who has the power is the guy who's willing to take it the furthest mm. these guys these mexican guys in prison <laughs> just based away. upon what they're, where they're from they don't care about dying yeah they're ready to go to they, heaven bro they don't th these dudes do not give a fuck about dying I give a fuck about dying. <laughs> that's it. And that's, that, it. That's, that's it. That's it. That's the finish line. I'm wow. 50 pounds lighter than you. I'm not fighting you. I'm going to stab you. <laughs> I'm cool. I, I, right. I know my boundaries. Then you, you win. Know? That's it. Yeah. They, a lot of a, a lot of guys have just like so many like the tattoo, the rosary. They're already, they almost just have like a funeral tattooed on their chest. Like, damn, dog, you're ready to die. You got your whole family standing around a casket on your chest. It's a wrap. Uh, let's go to one of these video questions real fast. Word. Bong, gang, gang. Um, and then what's up to Maurice? I'm a big fan of both of you guys, and I've been watching this past weekend since the beginning. And I decided to um, call him for a question or a video and a question. And uh, so, my question for Maurice is what led to you um, choosing Ohio State to play football at? And is there any advice you'd give me as a running back um, when picking uh, what schools I'd like to go to? So um, thank you both, and, um, you know, have a good day. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Ohio State didn't offer me a scholarship. Uh, I decided to go to Ohio State and told them I was coming, and um, um, and that was it. I knew I wanted to go to Ohio State. I knew the guys who were there. 
uh, they weren't better than me. You know, I was a lot more arrogant then. And uh, I think you have to be uh, arrogant and decisive within your decision making to understand if a guy's better than you or not and go where you feel that uh, you want to go, not where you feel like maybe cool. There's a lot of young guys who go to schools because they think the school is cool, uh, yeah. but it isn't a good fit for their skill set. You know, understanding your skill set. But the biggest thing I can give advice to the guys, understand your skill set. What do I do well? And does that translate to this environment right here? Right. And Plan I, ahead. That's a business decision. Yes. Yes. And so I understood very well uh, my skill set and what I did. And then I looked at their offense and it was the same thing. And uh, I went to go meet the guys. And I went to these guys. And uh, I, uh, I, 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 Mike Tyson's my greatest uh, person I want to meet, him and Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. If I can meet Jim Carrey and, and sit down at halftime with Mike Tyson, I think that that would be like some of the cool. <laughs> <laughs> shit um and and literally that's what happened i just was like you know i'm taking y'all shit and so mike tyson used to talk about uh the art of skullduggery and he said you know uh guys are they're very easy to compete behind each other's back but there's a different uh sort of uh reverence that you have when you tell a guy i'm taking your shit right you know what i'm saying and so now it becomes like i'm about to work my ass off and do you have that same deal and i knew that they didn't and that's basically how i became you uh, got mexican right there i got mexican i was really i was willing to die <laughs> <laughs> in that instance, in that vibe, you're like, hey, this is what I'm putting on the line is that I'm going to do this is as far as I'm going to go. Can you match it? But, so same thing that you do. Same thing that you do in your industry. Yeah. Motherfucker, I got this. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm going to take it to a place that I know that you can't. I'm going to take I always call it take a motherfucker to the middle of the ocean. Let's see who's going to get to the shore. <laughs> oh, yeah. You either going to die in the water or we're going to get to the shore. I love that, man. Um, and yeah, the other questions, I think the other guys would have some good input, even cool. though they were specifically for you. So. OK, great. Cool. Um. Awesome, Maurice Claret, Claret. So excited, uh, uh, so uh, grateful that you guys have come out. We'll be right back. Um, we'll be right back uh, with the other guys from uh, Business and Biceps. Business and Biceps, yes, sir. Yeah. We just had Maurice Claret in, and he is going to stay in studio. And joining us is going to be the Business and Biceps uh, guys, uh, the other gentleman from his podcast. And if you want to join something, you can join Skillshare.com and you can join a classroom. Skillshare.com, it's a place where you can, you know, take any class you want. You don't want to drive across town and park and get a backpack and get a Capri Sun and call your mom and have her make you a lunch and then get beat up at recess, do you? Well, now you don't have to, but you can still learn. Skillshare is an online learning platform, over 20,000 classes in business, design, technology, photography, or photography, creative writing, data science. Man, there's everything. You can learn how to make trap music. You can learn how to produce music. You can you can do anything. Everything. Think of something. Go learn it. And our listeners will get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. That's right. Skillshare is offering this past weekend listeners two months of unlimited access to over 20,000 classes for just 99 cents. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Theo, T-H-E-O, that's Skillshare.com slash Theo. This episode is also brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Quit running your business just in the real world. Run it online as well and run it with Squarespace. Squarespace has beautiful designer templates that make it uh, make it make your appearance creative and give you a powerful online identity. You can create a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform. Everything from domains, websites, online stores, and marketing tools. If you have a domain somewhere else, you can bring it over to Squarespace. That's easy. It's award-winning 24-7 customer service makes it exactly what you want. It's simple to set up. It's simple. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site or new store or new online presence, just go to squarespace.com slash Theo Vaughn, T-H-E-O-V-O-N, to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. That's squarespace.com slash Theo Vaughn for 10% off. Joining us now in studio with Maurice is Corey G and John Fosco, and this is uh, this is the three of them together make up the podcast Business and Biceps. We are here. You want to introduce your squad, uh, your partners? Sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, we are squad. Because you do it well. On, you do it well on the show. Re coming from yeah. <laughs> I'm from that Chicago Bulls pop. Oh, oh you're gonna get that. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
So he has he has the new shoes on today. <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> well, not them orange joints he had on. Yeah, huh? yeah. yeah so yeah. my main man Helling, all the way so from the Windy City, six foot two. He had to sit in first class to stretch his legs out on the way here, right? Motherfucker, six foot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say, bro. Yeah. Every inch, bro. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, this this room takes off yeah. two inches. Yeah. <laughs> Rip to the ball, my man, uh, all the way from the Windy City, the one and only, who always wears his sunglasses day and the night, in the gym. Yeah, yeah. I did request the glasses. <laughs> and is that Dottie Fosco? Mo, I love you, Mo. Here we go. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. And his tag and um and his tag team partner. And his tag team partner, the only guy I know who eats fucking chicken. No, not chicken because he says steak. The only guy I know. White steak, they call it. Some people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the White only guy I here. know who won't fucking go to the double tree and eat a fucking cookie when he goes in. <laughs> it's true. The only guy I know who is disciplined to the bone and regimented, hailing respectfully <laughs> and he talks about it all the way from the valley mr Corey g yo 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 <laughs> thanks maurice for introducing i, I don't want to say trailer Theo parks show. because i'm a black guy yeah. Yeah. Trailer yeah. Parks about a white guy seems racist i think yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I it's, it's funny i sometimes i get called oh and this is the uh this is these you guys started business on biceps right oh, and then start. brought maurice in yeah. how did that work out yeah uh we was rolling for a while, about 100 shows johnny I think about eight, 80 shows, yeah. Yeah. And then we were going to bring Mo in for a sports podcast, mm -hmm. right? And um, I, didn't, I didn't know Mo well, and uh, it was crazy. We recorded, like, the pilot of the sports podcast, and it was a really raw podcast. A uh, lot, lot, lot of swearing. Not that we don't swear now. We swear a ton still. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, yeah they, they, it's a little sweary. Yeah, it's very <laughs> sw sweary, but basically after we did it, the night we fucking did it, uh, most 30 for 30 came on and i had never wow. seen it i had never seen it and i called Corey after i watched it and i said Corey, i don't know mo well but if i'm if i'm going to take in a partner we're going to take in a partner um i don't feel comfortable as an individual uh bringing him into this platform i just don't feel it's right i think he can offer a lot on business and biceps because we're trying to motivate and we're trying to talk about overcoming struggles and my god you know what i just saw what you know touched me straight yeah. up so yeah. I, I you know Corey was like man yeah i mean I, me and mo had been boys for a while so it was like i said yeah absolutely i'd love to bring him into that space you know we were just we we wanted to do something with him we had already had a show that was starting to chart and do well so but open arms i was like of course mo's personal development and the stuff that he's been through um alongside us is is now morphed into a you know a top five show yeah and w was it interesting, like, or was it tough? Uh, um, is it tough befriending? And I noticed this even in my own walk out here in, in Los Angeles. It's tough sometimes befriending somebody that has like a name that precedes them. So what was that like for you whenever like you befriended Mo? Like, because sometimes it's like you'll feel a connection to somebody and you're not, you don't care what they do or what, you know what I mean? You're intrigued by them. You're interested. Mm -hmm. But when somebody has a name that precedes them, it's sure. hard sometimes to, to, how did was there did you have trouble managing your genuineness or was there anything uh, like that and i'm not putting you on the spot i'm just curious no, i think it should be great for mo to answer actually because when we when we connected mo had just come back to ohio yeah and i had a business that was doing really well in the sports supplement space and i told mo like i was working with huge athletes and, and some pretty heavy people sterling, and was, sterling sharp yeah way bigger than him <laughs> so i was like so i was like you know what i was like mo here's the deal we have a 4am crew uh, I, I asked mo to come to the gym and work out i said man i don't really need nothing from you but what you're going to get when you mess with me is i'm never going to miss workouts i'm going to be disciplined i'm about my business and but i don't need anything from you right i don't need to, to i'm not trying to get into the club and rep you i'm not trying to get a cute video on instagram i don't need any of that yeah. stuff I'm not, and I'm, so I don't really need somebody to uber my guns across yeah town. <laughs> yeah you know so i was like but i got a positive environment and if you and if you're trying to get down with it then you should come on over to the old school gym motherfucker and you felt yeah. that huh yeah, and uh, and I think that's the I think that's that was like highly important where you could just go be yourself. And I think we talked about it earlier, just going to be yourself somewhere and just be a guy. Yeah, you know what I mean. I think that that was uh, that was cool. And and nothing about uh, our relationship, we 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 didn't gain anything from being around each other. Yeah, we didn't like okay, let's connect and go do this deal. Let's connect and go do that deal. Let's connect and, and show a picture and 
it makes one of us cooler. And, uh, and I think that that was the the original part. But then also, um, I think that even when we start doing the first few episodes, I think that there was just a natural uh, feeling. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't nothing. Like, you know, like most times you get together with people, it's like, yo, let's outline the business. And you're worried about everything but the actual thing of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that we did more doing of the show and yep. talking as an episode. And I think it felt right. But I think also... If you can ask these guys, I think it was something therapeutic about it. Oh, you know wow. Really? Oh, um, yeah. Most yeah. definitely. Because we were doing it for the right reason. We didn't have a business model. We were just literally, John and I, when we started it, we were having these amazing conversations that I know all these young people would be down trying to, to be a fly on the wall. I'm like, we should record this. You add Mo to it on top of it, it's shutting it down. Right. Because now you have, there's uh, there's the race factor, there's the culture factor, there's mm-hmm. all these things that nothing's off bounds, and we can hit Nothing. every demo. Oh, wow, it's great. Man, and what? it's so necessary right now, yeah. I think, too, especially with a lot of, like, you know, there's a lot more, like, young black men who are having opportunities these days. Um, and do you guys see that in, in Ohio as much, like... These days, like, is it different than when you were growing yeah, up, do you find? But I think just, just with any young person now, I think the access to information and the wanting to sort of take control of your own destiny and be an entrepreneur yeah. are, are things of that nature. I think that that's more accessible. I think w- with young people, like, okay, so they see Theo Vaughn, right? They see you on Netflix. They see your podcast, and they may see what other people do, and they're like, I want that. Right. But they don't understand, and I don't even know your history, what the fuck you went through to get to that chair right now. Right. And they don't want to know the process. Uh, They want what Theo has. Right. And what we're trying to do is say, dudes, settle the fuck down, take pride in sweeping the floor, and say, I'm on my way up. Yeah. Don't think you're going to be driving that Bentley in two years because you're a stupid fuck. It's you know, just not the truth. That it's not gonna happen it. that way, dude. Every time John talks, I feel like I'm at uh, WWE in 1994, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in a loving way. It's hey, it's, it's really fascinating, straight down the middle, man. bro. That's but what you that's get. What I, love. <laughs> I was listening to an episode last night, man. I got some Hello Fresh, you know, because they're um they they're not even a sponsor of ours yet, but or they are a sponsor now. <laughs> 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 but look, uh, I was excited. I'm making some Hello Fresh, and I'm listening to an episode in the kitchen, and I felt. Here's what I noticed. I felt better at the end of the episode i felt like i just had a good time you know i felt like it was you guys were talking about loyalty um and you know and and loyalty and how you uh how you know where loyalty is and 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 how you recognize it like and how you treat loyalty and how you treat your friends and business associates and stuff and but then also there was like you know people screwing around and it was just like a little bit of everything before i knew it, it was over and i was like oh this is this is cool. It's like half entertainment. Uh, we've, we've added that because we're having so, so much fun now, but also giving people real applicable information because everybody thinks they can get a laptop and go to Starbucks and now they're an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. When I started my gym when I was 20, like my friends tried to have an intervention with me because they thought I was like fucking crazy. And, uh, you know, coming yeah, from I, I, business, dude. Yeah, Come they're on, like, wait, wait a second. You know, yeah, and so bro. it's like they were tripping like you ain't drinking with us on Wednesdays no more. <laughs> and I'm like, motherfucker, I'm trying to open a gym. Yeah. Like, so it was one of those things where it just wasn't as cool as or accepted now it is looked upon almost like an athlete or something to that level oh entrepreneurship is absolutely. almost looked upon as an athlete I, I, that's, absolutely wow. to some there, degree it's way more popular than it ever that's was that's why there's so many fake, fake motherfuckers, motherfuckers out there trying to drain <laughs> these it. kids <laughs> pockets dude and yeah. that's what gets me fired up it's like okay so we don't need to do a podcast is it a profitable endeavor sure we do other businesses and we do a podcast to literally try to give him for dude i didn't go to college he didn't go to college right mo didn't mo tried mo tried (laughs) mo Mo ran some fucking touchdowns right but 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 it's like we're trying to help people because like success doesn't happen dude right you gotta make it happen and these kids don't know that they they're told okay you go to high school you go to college you did it what if what if i don't want to like no one says like it's okay if you don't want to yeah what do you want to do right motherfucker go follow it but 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 that's not safe right because then otherwise then you just get the feeling as a kid oh if i don't go to college and i'm a failure that's yeah. the, that's what the other side of that teeter-totter yeah, is yeah it's like oh you're gonna be a bum it's like come on right. man and, and and we're here to dispel that and there's nothing against college you know if you want to be a doctor an engineer a lawyer sure you have to go there but if you love something 
don't tell yourself it can't be a career. Yeah. Because you're fucking lying to yourself. Yeah. And you're hearing your brother, you're hearing your uncle, you're hearing your parents who are all afraid, afraid to take the chance that right. you are about to take. Yeah. And you're going to let them take you. But fuck that. Yeah. You guys, I don't know. Go on. No, but I, I just think even, even to add to that point, but. Even, Dude, I feel like I'm on you guys' podcast. You are. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I feel, no. no joke, dude. I feel like I just morphed into it's my... Podcast. You are yeah. now in business and biceps, Theo. Bro, this is so cool. I'm not even joking, man. I, 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 I love this. Yeah, it's serious, though. But like, just, just imagine like there's, there's conversation, there's processes and systems that have to be built to build your own career. Yeah. And to, to what John was saying... People just want to jump towards the end result to be where you're at, but nobody talks about all the production that took place when we had to walk out the room to break to the segment. Nobody talks about the cameras. Nobody talks about the hard work. Nobody talks about the actual things, but how you feel during those processes and the things that you have to do to make that thing a reality. Right. And that conversation needs to be had because it's not had in the classroom or if it is in the classroom, it's inaccurate as to what's currently taking place. Mm. And I think that if we provide that information, then a kid can come back and say, you know what? I spent my hour listening to you all. I got something out of this shit. And you can kind of go through all the titles and find out where you're currently at in your process. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a library. The other one we have, Manage Your Dick, right? When you're successful <laughs> managing Manage Your, your Dick your- is a book? That's the newest it's the la- latest episode. Yeah, oh, we, yes. yeah, yes. yeah Oh wait, I think I did. I didn't click on that because honestly, I've had enough issue with that. Yeah. Yeah, so you, nobody mean, will I'm, help you. Yeah. <laughs> no hey, help. Straight from John Fosco. <laughs> it's the yeah. MYD program. Yeah, so, so, you yeah, stay John away Coyne, from it, dude. dude. Yeah. I just picture that guy with the megaphone in WWE back in the day, like right next to my penis, like <laughs> get erect. <laughs> What's that guy's name? Jim. What's his name? Jimmy Hart. The hit, Jim Cornette or oh, the Hitman Hart or Hart maybe oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Hart. Hart Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Hart just the slapping manager. on the side of the yeah, ring yes. get in there I like love Bobby it. the Brain Heenan yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Love it. well Bobby <laughs> the Brain Heenan is another euphemism for your penis too. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy so wow. anyway uh, but no I I, I um yeah I didn't click on that episode let me th- see I think I've listened <laughs> to four episodes but but yeah, I just love the camaraderie, man. Uh, I'm yeah. so grateful that you guys are here. Um, what do you guys feel like? Do you notice like a like a vibe in your own community from the podcast? Like that's what I start to wonder. What's it like there by you guys? Me and Corey were talking about this yesterday. It was crazy as we, so we have employees mm-hmm. and they all listen to the podcast, so they they know how we think. Right. So we've broken a lot of employees mentally unfortunately by absolutely doing nothing right so they get it in their head that we're these guys on the podcast and they say oh shit i messed this little thing up i'm gonna get the john from the podcast or i'm gonna get the Corey." and they get in their own heads and like we start losing labor and we're like brother no this is that that that's a show and yes we teach but we've lost people actually because they're like, man, they are so regimented in their thinking. I don't want to get in that line of fire. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's had it's had kind of a weird effect. But there's there's respect for people uh, uh, from the outside, people who who don't uh, work for us. Mm-hmm. But it, it's had a weird effect with employees. Yeah. I just huh. think online, the, just the overarching thing of we're here to teach and give back. We've all been uh, successful in our own regards. We're all pushing for more success, but understanding of what's happening in entrepreneurship right now and how fake as fuck it, that it is. Yeah. And that we're coming straight down the middle so often and that they can take it out and apply it. And then when it works, they're right in your DMs like, yo, bro, that shit was fucking real. I went and did this. Like, you know, it just, those things right there are worth it all. Because yeah. there's no monetary You're value to lives. that, bro. You're <laughs> literally, I was, at Gold's, I was at Gold's gym today training and people are coming up, showing love, dude, podcast, blah, blah. And I, hey, three out of four guys, I was like, I'm here to see Theo Vaughn. Oh, that dude's so funny. Like, oh, you know what I'm saying? So it's like the, the podcast community is just, it's cool to bring these two worlds kind of together, Theo. So, so I commend you, you know, for like being open to that. I think it's awesome. Yeah, no, well, look, a lot of my, a lot of our listeners are, you know, in the Midwest and in rural communities. Mm-hmm. And I don't consider, you know, where you guys are from a rural community at all. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I, it's it's nice to know that it, it, when I'm listening and I'm feeling inspired, you know, from a place that's a little bit more connected to America than I feel like the environment I live in is, you know, it's just, <laughs> uh, it's cool for me. I, I, um, I think re- real quick on the camaraderie, like uh, one main point is I think it's so hard to trust 
three people like all the way to the core and have that loyalty and that's why you can hear us hit like hard points mm -hmm. and then have fun with it because you know you may have a business partner but like you ain't down with them like you would trust him when your back was turned if some shit was going down but like the three of us we don't need each other and right. because we don't need each other everything we do is pure and right. because it's pure it could be serious as fuck but then it could be fun and it's like we don't need each other yeah so it's it's just fucking what it is right you know no i love that i mean that's one thing that podcasting has given even me as an entertainer is just freedom you know yeah. the freedom to if really to not live in some of these bounds of this in entertainment industry but to be myself you know it's like no it, rules homie yeah <laughs> And that's and then people love that, you know. People it, it, absolutely love it. it, it I, but I think that's the I think it's one of the greatest things about it, is that these podcasts have broken across all barriers, all ethnicities, all boundaries of subjects, titles, everything, mm -hmm. and that now you just have a platform to see the person, yeah, and to fall in love with the person. I think that that is what we bring to that. I, I, I always, I, in my mind, I think it's called business biceps and culture. Because I really believe that uh, I've loved some of the racial conversations that we had yeah. on the show that I know you couldn't get anywhere. I love um, just the, the, the back door of the business conversations. I love just, just the camaraderie amongst people. And I just believe that that is like something that if even if I just don't want, even if I'm just the only one who cares about it, I feel like that's our gift no. to mm. other people. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And yeah. When your his brother came in and we talked to his brother after the show, he's like, you don't get it. Like, in our community, we don't have Wi-Fi, and he's like, "Amazon ain't even a thing in the hood." You, yeah, you guys like like we don't listen to podcasts. We don't have why. And I'm sitting there thinking like, Amazon's not a thing, and 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 I'm like a lot a lot of people that I am unfamiliar with live like this, and yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, but that's a really powerful but, thing. I, I'm telling you, like, in, in and that was probably one of the most coolest things to me is to bring an environment or a perspective to a place and to have like honest conversation about it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just how the state of America is like the state of America has never been so intense when it comes to race. Right. Ever. You know, I don't know if they feel it out here in Los Angeles, but everywhere else you go in America, you feel like that. But to talk about a culture and to not be offended, to be easy going, to laugh, to joke, to say shit that's normally tougher now you have people in different environments who are like, yo, okay, I've had a chance to digest this information outside of like just one side, either it's a left wing or right wing way conversation. This is just an independent conversation. I think that that just helps to add uh, just to America or yeah. just to people's perspective. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, in, in LA, you guys also have a gift. I think that like in LA and our, I feel like sometimes we can't even talk about stuff. You know, like it would be, it's scary. Like, it's scary to have like race conversations and stuff out here because people also don't even understand what the rest of America is kind of really like. You know, no. a lot of people out here are third, fourth generation Los Angeles people so and think Hollywood it's people. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. The rest of LA is totally cool, man. You get out into some of these suburbs and like the Latino kids and stuff like that. They're fucking. They get it. They joke around like like crazy, like ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But then you get into some of these more like Hollywood circles, and it's like, man, you have to just. You just turn into such a muppet, man, that it's almost exhausting. <laughs> yes, it would be a little exhausting. You know? Maybe because it's it, exhausting because you gotta get to be free. Yeah, you know, man, it, it doesn't connect to your soul. And like, like at, at the end of the day, man, if you're connecting to vanity, you're connecting to bullshit, and you're you're sort of putting on this suit or this mask or this persona that just doesn't really tap into you. At some point, that shit just runs its course. Yeah. I, don't, I don't give a fuck who you are. I don't give a fuck how much money. It's like the beautiful girl who gets with the ugly guy because he has money. And then after uh, all of the, the chills and thrills and the boats and the planes and all that shit wears off, she wakes up like, man, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, who you is know what this I'm saying? dude? This dude it, named D'Artagnan. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it wears itself out. But, but you have guys who whore themselves out because yeah. like John's back home. I'm in California. Me and John grew up together on the internet i want to look cooler than john and that's where it stops right and then i sell myself and i'm not a whole person you know what i'm saying but like i, I think just the preservation of that and, and I, I like as we're as we're sitting here talking i'm like damn we hit on a lot of topics on our podcast Hell yeah. yeah i'm just thinking about the shallowness thing that you said and i'm going through my head and uh running through this feeling of ha being able to have a 
uh, partner of the opposite race that's black yeah. that on a couple shows I've been able to look at, and this is what I believe needs to happen more in America. I've been able to look at them and through a conversation, use the word nigger right. because that's what's going on, right? Like I, I think it's a gift to have someone of an opposite race to have a discussion where you could be like, these are how motherfuckers are talking right now in certain places. Right. So we're going to talk. Give him context for it. Yeah. Some person doesn't take it the wrong way. They'd be like, hey, yeah, no, 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 baby. Yeah. <laughs> no. I even need a little context. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. No, just, <laughs> just, just straight, no, but this is blunt. This is blunt this, conversation. This is just yeah. real shit. And in parts of the country that that oh make, yeah, people say it, and you some people can't say it, and it's uncomfortable, and they hear no, it. No, and listen, it's come back. Put right. it this way, it's come back oh, strong, yeah. and that's just what it is. And I want to know. And I'm comfortable enough and I feel blessed enough right, to have a guy that I could talk right to a black man and say, what is it like when you're fucking standing outside at a, at a food truck and some dude rolls by and says, fuck you, nigger? Yeah. Like, that's a real conversation. And I think that's how we start maybe to make progress. Right. And these surface conversations you refer to that you're scared of, like, the only way to, like, get through that is to knock the wall down you right. know it's like fuck that i ain't gonna live in this world if i can't have a real conversation with you i don't want to fucking talk to you right so let, let, me, let me give reference to the people who may not so john's not racist if anybody may like i'm trying to defend you so like people don't no, think, I understand like, it now is this guy you know is this guy racist no he's not racist but i think his personality and his bluntness and his forwardness allows us to like because he may have that thought in his head. You know right. what I'm saying? And he wants it's, to know this question. This yeah, is a thing that happens. Man, I lived in South Carolina. I heard five white guys walking down the street every night, you know, going to the bars in Charleston. I didn't hear that 10 years ago. Right. This is real. And I want to know, I'm not saying it. I right. want to know how a black man feels about it's, it. It's, right. It's, that matters to me. Right. So, so being able to take it that far, not be offended, not feeling any way about it. Like I'm, I, I feel like this. I, I've I've experienced enough, even from prison. Right, I was in prison with this guy named Chad. Chad was a part of the Aryan Brotherhood, and I asked Chad, "I'm like, yo, like, why do you dislike black people?" And I think I said this one on one of our early mm -hmm. episodes. He just like Maurice. I've never grew up around any, and so I was like, well, he doesn't really not like black people. He just never grew up around them. Yeah, no different than like somebody who just never grew up around people. Like he's like, I'm just choosing to stay around white guys. And I just want to be around white guys because this is what I'm familiar with. And so I didn't look at Chad as like a back. I'm like, this motherfucker is just ignorant. Right. You know, so he's just never been exposed. And so like to be able to have these conversations like or or even to have the conversation, I'm a black guy who lives in a neighborhood where I know how I don't feel accepted. Right. But I don't want to be in the hood. I don't want to be in the suburbs. And so you have these conversations. And so now I have people who are of a different race who could tell me like, this is how people feel. Right. This is. A but, but, but so now we're dealing with the truth now. Right. You know what I'm saying? But then these people may not like me for fictitious reasons. So like, actually, why don't you like that a black person is living in your neighborhood? And who is it that I don't like? Or what is it that I don't like about you? But peeling that stuff back makes this conversation real. Yeah. And so now we're dealing with the human side but now we can grow if we've dealt with the reality of stuff but being able to talk about but but in in business these are all factors into people dealing with each other right how to deal with other people and then that these, all, that plays into all business so yeah. you take into business and biceps you take business all the stuff, psychology bro but we, what it is. but we're, yeah. we're dealing with all with each other whether these are employees whether these are people answering your calls to pass you off to the right person whether these are people introducing to you whether they have a pre preconceived notion before y'all get together these are all things that make all of us up but you tell me right now where are you going to go get this conversation without being ridiculed about that happening right you know what I'm saying you're not going to get it anywhere but in America, this is a fucking factor, but I appreciate that I'm here to where it's 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 a it's a respectful and wholesome and I don't take shit personal conversation because like we're trying to get to a space to where you can like, okay, let's get some resolve and grow from this. Like that's the that's the front side, that's the intention. Right. Yeah. Let's get some yeah. I like it. No, I mean I think it shows that you guys are yeah, I mean, it's one of the the gifts of you guys' dynamic. Is that yeah. you can talk openly? It's not about happening stuff. anywhere else, man. Right, and peeling back that poverty's poverty, man. Whether you're a white kid from Appalachia, oh, like yeah. myself, yes. or from the hood, a Youngstown, from South Side of Chicago, wherever it, all of that 
it's different factors and it might be different parts of the country, but it's resources, it's education, it's opportunity, it's Dude, that's what it is. Yeah, and racism, a lot of times, and hatred and stuff like that, when you're poor, man, it's just the, if you have nothing else. You got no so, reference. And, but also, sometimes it's the <clears throat> only thing you can do. You have nothing. You have no education. The one thing you have control over yeah. is Your homeboy Bo hate. has a Confederate flag on his truck, and you're like, hell right, yeah. Right, it's to hate somebody, you yeah. know? And it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, sometimes it's just like a thing that comes in poverty. Poor people love to fight. It's all they have to do. It's, you know, it's that's like... What they, that's what they take pride in. And it's a free... Well, it's, it's something free. to do. And it's something to do. Free too. It's a free activity. <laughs> it's a free <laughs> activity, bro. It really, really is, dude. You know what I'm saying? You were lucky if somebody would have cut their hose. How we're laughing at the end of that? Water. I'm not sure. Dude, I, I remember it. when if somebody cut their hose on and let you use their water, they were like keeping a watch on how much water you're getting out the hose. Like, <laughs> dude, some of this shit was ridiculous, you know? Um... Yeah, but I think it is a gift of you guys' podcast, man. I think it's one of the things that's neat. Uh, and I think it's, a, I, I agree, it's conversations that need to be heard, you know? Like, I mean, I grew up, you know, they had, yeah, you. Well, I just didn't realize when I was growing up, you would see black families, you'd be like, oh, they don't care about themselves. You know, yes. that's what you would think. You know, you would see a black family, you know, it would be like, um, I what would give you the thought from saying that they don't care about each, they, themselves? Probably. Like, what would you visually see, like, process? I would see, like, you know, probably they're, you know, they, you know, maybe the, the, their neighborhood, they didn't try mm -hmm. to keep their neighborhood up gotcha. or they didn't, you know, like, um, the parents were smoking weed or, you know, the mom was smoking weed. The kid was buying weed for the mom, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, or also, uh, things, you know, it's a really a great question, you know, I guess like, oh, the kids, some of the kids couldn't. You know, we had kids in seventh grade that couldn't talk even, really, you know? And they were in seventh grade, you know, black kids. You probably you asked know? how could this be? Right. And so then it made you think, I guess, actually, I didn't, it made me think, oh, they don't care about themselves, gotcha. you know? Now, as I get older, and now I live out here, and I see more of the world, you know, and I understand that, like, oh, well, if you have generation after generation of a family not having any income or if the grandfather gets a parking ticket and that means that the son you know the grandson isn't going to get a christmas gift you know like if it's that fine of a line yeah now as i get older the social I economic see, factors. oh you see it it's so much clearer but from me as a child being in an environment you don't see it and you also don't get the information nobody's telling me this my perspective that i can am able to see now and then also black and white people fight all the time so or would be fighting so then you have this other thing where it's like you know are we even allowed to get along like do they hate me you know and then like yeah it's i mean it's a messy environment sometimes you know and and i feel bad about some of the ways probably that i thought as a kid but as a child, some of them were probably survival mechanisms and they were thoughts that, you know, I needed maybe at certain points to make me feel a certain way or, and sometimes safety mechanisms, you know, like I grew up in poor black and white and those people were, there was a lot of fighting sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I was scared of both of those, a, a lot of those people sometimes, not all of them, you know, some were, had friends in mm -hmm. both areas, but in, in poverty, there was a much more of a chance yes. for volatility. And that's what made me really, really nervous, you know. I think volatility. you hit on a, a major thing I, I, as I'm listening to you, you know, uh, black and white poverty are probably very similar in terms of the things you reference about not being able to speak or not keeping up your yard or something like that. But like uh, a crucial part to everything, whether it goes back three generations or four generations, is like everybody has to take it upon themselves. And we talk about this mm -hmm. a lot to break the cycle. And it's the hardest fucking thing to do yeah. because... Your family doesn't understand you. Your relatives don't understand you. But there's always got to be one. There's always got to be one in the family that's like, fuck this. No more fucking 800 square foot house with the roof leaking. Like, <clears throat> I'm going to do something about that. Right. Like, there's got to be one. And We are uh, all those ones, by yeah. the way. Much. And I think that's why I resonate, you know, with you guys' podcast. I mean, it's funny. Like, my... And one thing that I've learned is my brother now, you know, he started a successful business in tree business, right? He doesn't like trees, really, but he likes business, you know? So he realized now, he's like, damn, I can, if I see a damn two by four, I'm about to slip my throat with it, you know? <laughs> but he loves business. But one thing he realizes looking back in our neighborhood is just child psychology. And so that's what he wants to get into now. And so he uses like the YMCA and it's like very, it's extremely black and white kids mm -hmm. over there. And he doesn't really see a difference. Um, you know, we don't see some of the same differences we saw as kids. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but to see him wanting to help children so much, no matter who they are, you know, that's it's, how you um, change a community. That's how you change a community, right? Oh. And and he's really a big inspiration to me. But but it's uh, when I really think of, I was thinking about this the other day. When I really think back. The kids that I associated with the most were kids that felt the I could see felt the same way that I did. Which way was that? And it didn't matter if they were black or white. It almost was a color that was within us. Mm -hmm. It was some other gray color within us or a confused color within us. Do you feel like a, it, was, it came from like a space of struggling? Yeah, like a space of struggling and probably a space of just not really having, um, you know, structure within to know how to handle just day-to-day -day situations, not knowing when to be confident, not knowing, you know, because sometimes your confidence would get strayed. You'd be confident at a time when people, like, what the fuck are you being confident right now for? It's a spelling bee. You know, you you up here yelling, and, <laughs> you up here yelling and screaming about vowels, like calm it down. You know, how'd you how'd you get the confidence to say, you know what, I'm funny, I'm I'm, I'm gonna go after this shit. How, how'd you get it? Oh. Uh, you know, I don't know sometimes. I think sometimes it's one of those things that kind of stayed. It was like this this light that stayed in me that I needed. I think it was a defense mechanism when I was young. You know, I couldn't really physically take care of myself much. So I had to joke. I had to be the jokester. Um, and then joking kind of transcended. You could, like, black kids love to joke around. White kids, like, you know, it was, you were kind of, the jokester was always welcome everywhere. Unless you joke everywhere. too much, then you got your ass beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the risky line. Gotta run the line. That was a risky <laughs> line, man. But no, I mean, look, this is, I mean, even moments of this conversation have been a little bit uncomfortable for me but not in a bad way sure and i recognize that because i'm in a place where you know i know you guys are you know people that care about the end of this conversation yes. and the next week and the next year and the next 20 years of of you know of young men and young women um growing and, and you know we're not just thinking about you know, this moment right here. Um, and I feel that, and I feel that when I listen to you guys' podcast. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, I still don't know if Fosco should be allowed on the air sometimes, dude. <laughs> dude <laughs> me and Marie's well, always looking at each other like, this motherfucker. Know, hey. Dude, but now as I see him in person, I realize he's, he's <laughs> so intensity, WWE, bro. bro, bro right. It's real. But I thought, I'm like, this guy's hamming up. Get him a contract. Bro, I <laughs> never been. Oh, dude, he could be in the easily. Dude, listen, just, listen. <laughs> we, have, we, we, have, we have a disclaimer before I speak for yeah. him. <laughs> But but what he does <laughs> is that he pushes the boundaries on what we're talking about. Yeah. Always. Right? So he pushes so one it's two things, right? So one, I didn't realize he was that introspective and intelligent. So they may some people may think you're a comedian, but I listen to people what they say. It's the same thing with him. Yeah. Right. Sometimes people's personality be so harsh that people forget like they like fucking deep introspective, well thought out people. Yeah. His personality may be different than yours. You feel where I'm coming from? Yeah, I feel you. And I'm referencing John to people who are uh, talking. Dude, you got to see this John Fosco guy, man. I can't even, this guy's <laughs> fucking something else, bro. I'm not, I'm not joking. I've never met anybody like this dude, man. Yeah, but he, but he, push, he pushes, Corey, would you, Corey Absolutely. would say, Corey would agree. Yeah. He pushes and then it may come off harsh and brutal and tough. But then it's followed it's up. It's usually by, dead on, though. It, it's right. dead on. <laughs> it's followed up to leverage it by something intellectual. Yep. And then you can volley with the conversation back and forth. And at the end of it, you say, okay, he may have come with me hard, but if I digest what the fuck he said, he's not fucking lying. Like, the right. man, my girl listened to the Manager Dick program. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know amazing. what I'm saying? <laughs> but well, at, but it, it was true. Harsh. <laughs> bop, bop, yeah. Just like, like my man Johnny Duke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's fucking kind of like makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think if when you gloss over things, um, you're you're increasing uh, the probability that people don't do not take them and understand them and digest them clearly. Wow. So if you come right down the middle, mm -hmm. it may sound harsh. They may think you're an asshole, or they may love you. They they normally go one or two ways. Mm -hmm. um, but at least you're <laughs> yeah. giving real information and i don't fucking care who likes me right i actually like to be not liked because um if you like me that that, that that that's cool but i i have like this um responsibility i've always felt this um to the truth and if it's not the mm. truth fuck you fuck whoever <laughs> like get out of my face bro like i want nothing to do with yeah. you like i don't play any of those games and and, and that's and that to me is beauty because that that's purity when you're speaking in truth bro that's the substance that's right. where it's at once you you know we always say we don't talk about things i can talk about my car my houses for what right who's that benefit right nobody let's talk about the skills yeah we can give people to not just get things but become better people 
help their family and and fucking be happy yeah and and if you don't like the way i say it fuck you yeah i, th- I think that constant <laughs> i think that <laughs> being uncomfortable though is huge theo no that's it's where huge the growth is at so like i i told john the other day so funny it would have been that. uh coming off an, another venture it'd have been really easy for me to just kind of coast and be comfortable john i like him and he keeps you uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? So some people don't, they dislike John because of that. They just don't fuck with him. Mm-hmm. Where it's only pushed me to be better. And I told him that the other day, like, bro, I just appreciate it. Because it would have been much easier for me to just kind of coast. Yeah. And because I know what I've got myself into, that it's going. there's going to be uncomfortable moments. And we're talking about reference to business because we have multiple businesses together. He keeps pushing. And the podcast being one of them, he's going to push the limits, which makes you go a little bit deeper on things and you know try to reverse and, and push him. And that's what we've been doing, all three of us. And to your point on... Um, on changing that, uh, changing the uh, cycle, breaking the cycle. I wanted to ask you: Is is what you've been able to do broke the cycle for your family? Is it giving your family like a new breath of air that things are possible, like from where you come from? I think so. I mean, I think uh, you know, I think one thing for me, honestly, like you know, a lot of my family's ended up with addiction. You know, it's been like a big thing in our family, and I think uh, um, yeah, I just have learned a lot about. You know, it makes me, re- I've learned, for some reason, it makes me feel really sad when somebody doesn't know how much they're valued, you know? Mm-hmm. And that really, for some reason, like, it breaks my heart, you know? And I think, because I, I I think as a kid, I needed just somebody to know that they valued me, you know? And my mother worked really, really hard, you know? She worked, you know, delivered newspapers and still does, and, you know, and and I, I think she never was taught some of those things, you, you know, uh... And so then, yeah, then I'm able to see a lot of the cycles, you know. And then when I watch, like even when I watch like, you know, Maurice's 30 for 30, like there's a, you know, I couldn't connect on a lot of the football stuff. I could connect like from a fan perspective, like, oh, it looks yeah. like so much fun. And like, you know, <laughs> did they really beat Miami? And like, I could connect. How <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, he throws that <laughs> in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I could connect on like, uh, but then I, 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 I could connect. There was, there was some moments where I connected like, Oh man, I wonder if that young man knew how much he was valued as a kid, you know? Like I wonder if he got the love that he, you know, like that's where it made me think like, man, that's that might be a place that I have in common with that man. Um not that I need to have him to have it in common with me, but that's a place where I could feel something, you know? And that's the part that I really um and that's the part that now when I go back into a community or I look at a kid, you know, or I look at a family or anybody, I'm able to see it from you know, from that. And that's where I feel like I know in my heart, that's a place that I can, that's a place that I can start to help at, you know, ha- find some way to let people know, uh, that they're valued, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for some of the race stuff, it just took a, getting a bigger perspective. It's hard when you're in those perspectives and you know, when you're in the, and when you're in a small place, it's hard to see the big picture, you know? Um, well, as long as you get to a place where you figure it out or, at least you hear the information. I think that that's very important. And the reason I like to talk about it so much is because you deal with it on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, sometimes we only like to talk about race in like these harsh conditions or it's like an extreme view one way or another, or you have some sort of, um, you know, police shooting or you, the race gets commercialized with the Carlin Kaepernick deal. And sometimes you lose the actual message of what's going on. But if you don't have these conversations, then you don't deal with the truth. And if you don't deal with the truth or you're not working towards to shift the perspective to where, you know, we all fucking people at the end of the day, like nobody's better than nobody. And, you know, you don't have to have a harsh perspective on somebody because they're black or white. And even, you know, you, you deal with racism and you do with classism. And just because another yeah. person doesn't have as much as you do, it doesn't mean that they're, uh, they're less than you. Right. And to and to yes. have that stuff and to and to talk about that and to have platforms to do about it, I just think it's to be responsible with your voice. And for anybody who's been through any hardship, like if you've been through addiction, uh, there's no way that you can feel that you're better than anybody. Yeah. Because you've been fucked up and you've been not been able to take care of yourself and you've not been responsible at some point. So at some point you were like the person who's uh, vulnerable or the person who comes from the lower socioeconomic background. But it's it's the same thing with everything, but those are the human things. And, and, and like I say, I know this is about our podcast, but having the vehicle and the people who come from those backgrounds and to be able to talk about it and yeah. put it out there. It's a blessing you guys have it. Bro, it's, it's a huge. Cool. It's, I believe it's the only weapon to move, let's say, maybe the two hardest things in this country forward. Um, 
it, it, having a white man and a black man talk about real issues when they don't have to, if those conversations could happen in every county, mm -hmm. in every house, every day, that that's going to move something racially forward. Yeah. Let's say you take one political side now and the other political side, you don't have to agree, but if you can just have a civilized dialogue, you will find, hey, I might not agree with you, but we got shit in common, bro. Yeah. You're cool. And no one's willing to have those conversations because we're so divided and 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 that and that is ignorance at its finest. With, with yeah. Divided with trivial shit. And like how many times do we have this conversation? Yeah, with trivial Man, stuff. Trivial shit, so right? Fucking stupid. I, and old school shit. It's like old school stuff is to, like plays out thirty years back. later. Like, yeah. so, so ask yourself like this. When when ask yourself this. When have you ever had platforms to have these conversations? Right? These what these conversations gonna happen in the fucking town hall? No. Where these gonna happen in school? No. Well, we congregating at the library talking about there's no podcasts or platforms which you control, right? You're not going to the radio station and say, yo, like 1072, whatever the fuck it is. You know, can we get on here? Can we, can we have this conversation? <laughs> yeah, this dude, like, we can't talk about that. You know, yeah, or, or, or just let, like, let me get a little further into it. What do we have? Like some uh, some representative who think he represents all black people. You have somebody with, a, with an agenda who's fucking being right. Sharpton comes you out just, with his no, fucking just, term. Just, just, yeah. just be, just, it, it just is what it is. But, <laughs> you know, these motherfuckers come and they, they don't represent all voices. Right. They want to be a superstar Star. then. It also, yes. there's a level of uh, of achievement that they're trying to achieve. Yeah. So, 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 it's, so it's not honest. And so I'm not about to cry about the fact that we didn't have it. I just want to know. And, and so this was, a, I'm going to tell you what it would inspire me even more. It's the University of uh, Maryland, Virginia, one of those Rutgers, one of those universities I was telling you all about. They had a session where they were um, hosting for white kids how to deal with racism. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm looking at this shit, I said, on a college campus, you are inviting a space for all white kids to just understand how to process this shit. So somebody had the foresight to say, this is a real fucking thing. And kids may have uh, feelings that they feel about something, or incorrect information. So how do I deal with this shit with the climate in America? So you have to ask yourself, right? If they're fucking giving this shit to kids on a college campus, right? And you're hosting a safe space for these kids to express themselves because there's probably a space where a person can't say, just like John say, um, you know, there's people in our neighborhood who may think or, or who look at you all as niggers. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a real thing in America. And that same person who feels that way may be the same person at fucking Starbucks or the same person at the fucking local gas station. And until you have healthy dialogue with these people, nothing's going to change. These yeah. people are going to grow up with these same views. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, it hasn't changed. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff has just been the same types of things that haven't really changed that much. Bro, I, I like so. What are the incentives to change them? Right. I the, mean, when you really come so, down so, to so it. So for me, just a better fucking America. Well, I'm, I'm you saying, know what I'm saying? Right. On an individual yeah. level, but unfortunately. I keep on hitting Chris for uh, my fault. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you, Chris. You're, yeah. you're a beautiful man. It's like a, it's like a tackle drill over here. <laughs> yeah. It's good, right. though. Yeah, but like outside of individuals, what are the incentives? I mean, you always got to follow the money and the people who control our shit. That's why voting is so important. Hey, they make the rules and they don't have... Right now, there's a huge incentive to keep us divided. Yeah. A huge one. Oh, I agree. And, and let's just open our eyes Yeah, and, and, and say, well, what can we do about it? Don't throw your hands up like a pussy and say, I can't do anything about it. Have hard conversations, you know, try to find real people. But yeah, I mean, we're in these conditions because the people who we voted for um, contribute to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's wild, man. And, and you know, it's so funny you say pushes the boundaries and then growth you were talking about as well. Because, yeah, when you said that a little bit ago, I'm like, fuck, now there was like this space in the room, right? But then we had to fill the space, you know? Absolutely. And that's what, I mean, it was just, it was really, really interesting. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, I think, yeah, racism's tough because there's a lot of like white people, I think like, you know, I grew up, I got jumped a couple times by black kids, you know, and it made me, I mean, I grew up in fear of like some of the white kids in our neighborhood and I got beat up by some of them a couple times, but it made me, so then when I would see like a group of black guys sometimes. This is a therapy session. I would I like get scared this. though, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I would get scared, you know, and I didn't want to be, I think I didn't want to be angry, like in my heart, I didn't want to be angry at black people. But I would be scared of those types of kids. And if I saw a replica of a group like that or something in my head, it's just like, um, you know, if a, if a Doberman attacks you, then when you see a Doberman, you're going to be nervous. You, know? you get the feeling. Absolutely. So I had a lot of those feelings. And I think, you know, I think there's probably a lot of like, 
you know other people that have had similar type of feelings yeah but but it's but it's the same like but don't get me wrong black people are scared of black people yeah you know and and it's not the black people it's the behavior and the environment you yeah. know white people are scared of white people it's oh i would people. get scared if oh uh, there's a couple of, there's look there's some dudes in my neighborhood who you know allegedly they killed a couple people with a truck you know and it's just like man i'm way scared so, so just think about well. this so we're walking through life with these prejudices or these but i'm just being earnest about things that i've thought no you know? yeah, no no, no it's but, but it's cool like i mean That's... you you say that it's it's no difference than how i may feel towards a white person who comes in my community as a young black kid yeah. if, whether you're a police officer or whether you're just white in our neighborhood what the hell are you doing here you know yeah. what i'm saying things that you don't know are, are really believing or growing up believing that all white people are racist. Yeah. You know, like they just don't like black people. You know what I'm saying? But that's not true. It's not true yet. You know what I'm saying? But think about media, dude. Th okay, so so I always, always say this and people can judge me for whatever. That's but sad, like, man. I'm sorry that, 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 that's the, that that's ever been a perception. It's a, that makes me sad too. But it's ignorance. Uh, right. the, the perception is built from ignorance. But like what is, what is, I'm sorry if this upsets listeners, but like what does Fox News put out there? They put out pictures of Black Panthers at voting booths. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, like this is what's consumed for like six to eight hours by a lot of America. I ain't dogging Fox. It could be MSNBC going the other way. But like, these, this is what people are consuming. So they may not even have to get a beating. Right. They see it on TV and they're like, oh, I'm not going to the voting booth. Black Panthers are there. No, right. Not. Yeah. It's like the same with the Charlottesville thing. Like, yeah, they had some racist kids, racist young people or middle-aged people that showed up there, right? People that we don't need anywhere, you know, like not a type of hatred you want anywhere. But then to make it seem like it's 100,000 people and a pop, you know, that scares so many people and makes things a lot more, you know, racist than they really are, Divide. you know? Yeah. We, uh, because they keep us, the more news we make, the more fighting, the, the news stays in business. If we go to war... The news will cover it, and we stay. They stay in business, She's and they get better insane. ratings. Yeah, why they stand outside getting blown around by her? Say, Maurice brought up on the podcast one time, Theo, that uh, it, running at the track in the morning. So I'm at the track in the morning oh, all wow. the time, right? Yeah, and I'm out there running, so lunging. Gets up early, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. like at three. But so I'm up there, <laughs> you know, running, lunging. You're like Jocko Willing, <laughs> he's way tougher than me. Come but on, <laughs> so I'm also just stay up all night. With you basically, guys. there's really no point. So, you know, I'm at the track and there's other people there in the morning. I'm lunging my 800 meters of things I do. And, and I don't think no, no different. It doesn't matter if the person's white, black, uh, purple walking around the track. Marie says, and I'm in a black hoodie hooded up the whole nine, right? Marie says, I'm at the track and there's, um, a white woman, uh, running or walking by and I'm out here by myself. Then it makes me like, oh, yeah. it's the thought that goes through that. I never even would even think about Theo. When he brought it up on the podcast, I was like, man, that fuck. But yeah, it's real. That's he's 250 wild. pounds. He's a fucking big dude. And it's like black. those, yeah. and he's black. So and the things that you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> of that and he scare stole that ball from Sean Taylor that one yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so you know he's got the grip. So it's like those things, those things, those things are real, bro. And it's like a lot of people wouldn't even think that wow. that's even a thing. But it, just think, so just think about that. Yeah. That is a real thing. Every time I go to the track, to the point, I can grab my phone and show you what my lawyer, I text the lawyer and say, look, this is weird, but I'm texting you, but I'm, this is <laughs> right. six no, in the morning. I can imagine. Yeah, I can't even Serious imagine Serious shit. That. But I'm thinking to myself that anything can be said and my life can be altered or she can feel nervous or whatever it is. I mean, but, but, it, but it's simple shit. I can, even when I go to the gym in the morning, I can, I can, without a shadow of a doubt, if you're on the treadmill, I don't want to be by the black guy. If I'm lifting weights in a certain area, I don't want to be by the black guy. And it's almost weird to the point like I'm the black guy until somebody introduces me as Maurice Claret. And then when I get introduced as Maurice Claret, oh, this is a cool nigga. Yeah. You feel where I'm coming from? Oh, yeah. Like now it's acceptable to talk to me. And so in my head it plays like who the fuck was I before I became Maurice Claret to you? Mm. You know what I'm saying? But these are real things. You know what I'm saying? Like stuff that they never think about. Like even when we walk out here in LA, like I know if I'm around them and talking with them, like it's an easier, um, it's easier for me, it's easier for people to talk to me when I'm two with two white guys. Right. You feel where I'm coming from? Yeah. Literally, you don't you like you don't go through this, right? When I go to the barber shop, based upon what event that I'm about to do, okay, I gotta shave my face because I'm a little bit more softer on people. You know, saying a beard makes me look a lot more aggressive and a lot Damn. more this is but yeah. this is this is just not my story. This is a story of preconceived prejudices and 
all this is stupid shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? And what I'm saying is like to have uh, somebody you can volley conversations, not that business and bicep, and I don't want to get this perception that we just deal with race. No, it's okay. This is good. This is a conversation that, you know, like this is the kind of thing is that, you know, things happen on you guys' podcast that can be just a good conversation. It just It's just a good conversation amongst other stuff that we're talking about. But the fact that race has been so vacant from America and people's conversation, you can look at it as if like it's this distant thing, but you deal with it every day. And that's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it prepares you to work with others, right? Yes. So if we're digging into race and you go and get a job in an office with 10 people or 100, like this stuff will prepare you to work with the Muslim who your dad said, you know, attacked us on 9-11. Right. Like, you hear this shit and you're like, all right, none of that. So it, it, it's important. It all ties to business. It all tie backs. Uh, there's always a meaning. And I think the meaning should never be about any of us. It should just be about like, hey, I'm trying to share this shit with you. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes, um, no, I love this, man. I, I, I love even having the opportunity to talk, to, to even think about this, you know. I mean, sometimes I get I get intimidated by black guys because I feel like they're cooler than me. And so, <laughs> I'm not joking, bro. I'm really serious. Like hip hop culture like, drives. The but cool no, if I saw right three now. black guys that were like that looked cool, <laughs> dude, I'm not joking. I, and I think it's a this is a real fear. I don't know what the fear is called, <laughs> but I'm not joking, man. I feel really intimidated. Like not that they, yeah, I don't know. I guess I like feel a like dance contest is gonna break out any second. Or like, I don't know. what is it? But I feel that. I feel that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to identify what he's yeah, feeling. Yeah. And That's I don't amazing. know what it is. I'm not saying that they that they that they're angry at me or that I'm a, I'm just saying like like I get in I would get more intimidated by three like cool looking black guys than like three like if it was three cool looking white guys, I would just probably think like, oh, those are rich guys, whatever, dude. But if it was three cool <laughs> black guys, for some reason I would feel intimidated. And it could just be a me personally thing, you know. I don't and know. it probably is, but I kind of fuck it. I love this. Maybe yeah, I would just though. maybe think that I'm not as cool. I, I I can't be as cool as those guys. Maybe that's what it is, <laughs> you know. I don't know. <laughs> that, well, I, I don't know. I mean it, it, and yeah. Hip hop hip hop culture is cool. Hip hop culture is cool. I think, you know Yeah, and I think it just looks better. I think hip hop culture looks better on black guys. <laughs> so then maybe that's why. I don't maybe know. that's why. I I don't know. I don't know. Um, but uh, but I don't. Yeah, man. You know what's so funny? I, I, the first time in my life that I ever, I was out about a year and a half ago out here. I was having a tough time getting any traction in my career, and they, you know, this is a lot of like a lot of during the political stuff, and everybody out here was like, "Fuck all white people from the Midwest and from the you know and from the <laughs> South." Like a, anybody right. that I even sounded like, like my father's from Nicaragua, right? My mother's from Chicago, from uh, Peoria, Illinois. Mm -hmm. But anybody that even sounded like me or looked like me, they were, oh, this no, this is bad. We don't want this on the air. This is not what we're going for. Uh, this guy doesn't have a chance here right now. They're so liberal out here. It was so liberal. I mean, dude, we couldn't even, uh, we could not wow. even speak. But here, here's an interesting moment that happened to me. I was like, man. I felt a, I felt bad about the way that I looked. I felt bad about the way that I sounded. And I felt like because of those two things, I wasn't going to be able to live out my dreams, which were to be, you know, in, in the entertainment industry. So you sure. felt like a black person. So there was a moment for the first time yeah. in my life I was like, wow, this must be what it feels like to be... Uh, to be black sometimes, or to be of maybe a woman, or you know, to be yeah. But I, the first thing I something thought was black bro, because listen, listen. of something you can't change. It, it was, but I never had that much Rubik's cube kind of shift in one moment. You so know? just think about it like this: so if you felt like that in the moment, imagine how a lot of black people feel all the time. Yeah. That before we even get to if I'm talented enough or skilled enough, or am I even acceptable to do what you're being asked for? I got to deal with how I look and how I sound. You just basically said the same thing I said. What? How I got to like? So, the reason I cuss a whole lot is to let people know you can. You allow know, they take curse words and still make it. Yeah. The reason I'm myself all the time amongst these two is like you can still be yourself. You don't have to be a coon or Uncle Tom or you don't have to switch who you are in order to make it in life. Like you can still be yourself, and I think that that in itself is my responsibility. Whether they feel like it's whether some people are turned off by it, whether they say it's not professional enough. But even even hearing you said, I was like, wow, I didn't even realize how that can be an adverse effect to you because some people may identify you as like, he's a Trump supporter or he may be somebody who looks like people who hate black people and we don't want this to be um, either, represent. We, we don't want to be involved with this. Right. But to even feel like that is to feel like how a lot of people feel. And even though in certain segments or parts of America, 
people don't deal with this or we shouldn't have to deal with this. I think it's just like, just think about how stupid that is though. Yeah. Like I have to, like that has to be a thing. You know what Oh I'm yeah, I but, couldn't imagine that. I, I can barely get out of my car and know, make sure my fucking shoes are tied. I couldn't imagine, you know. At that point though, from a success standpoint, because a lot of people when they when they deal with doubt or circumstances that are challenging, they say, mm, maybe I should adapt who I am or maybe I should come at it differently when I think we all know the key to any kind of success is authenticity, pure authenticity. Did you ever at any point in that process say, mm, maybe I got to dial back the accent. Maybe I got to fuck with the haircut. Maybe I got to be less of me to make it out here, which I, I it's a question. No, it's first. a great question. I, I did. I mean, I, I actually for a while, I tried to sound like really, really mainstream and not be myself. You know, I think I grew this haircut out because I looked at a picture of myself and I'd always had short hair and I have a big nose. So it's like you can hide a big nose better if you got, you know, more hair or something, you know, like that. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, (laughs) Sorry. But you can. But so those were things that some of this was insecurity. But then Mm -hmm. once I started growing my hair, I was like, oh, oh, I I saw a picture of myself. I said, I never want to see my I'll never know what it's like to have long hair in my whole life because all my pictures are short hair. I said, maybe I'll change it up a little and just Mullet. try. Yeah, try something wild, you know? Love it. Uh, and in Canada, this is a hockey haircut. In Canada, you, yeah. sp- you think this, they think you f- play for the Canadians, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, but here, yeah. down here, it's like they don't know what you do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't, man, I, I look forward to coming. I'd love to come on you guys' podcast. I'll be in Columbus. Um, I didn't even announce these tour dates yet, but it'll be in the early, early spring. Hell yeah, we can't wait to watch it. So I'd stage, love to talk bro. about this kind of stuff some more. Just think about it, man. You know? Oh, no, well, I can't wait. This is a. Uh, I, this is the I've been, one I've enjoyed myself and two I I'm glad I didn't listen to you before I came on because like now he's like fuck you in his head yeah like, no so like I, I was like you no know, one I said okay is this guy cheesy right oh yeah yeah so first sometimes of all, no, no, no. Well, I'm 38 dude the level of queso is you start to get older <laughs> in age it builds up on you bro you can't help I, I was asking myself queso. but then like after you start talking. And and like I there's a there's a deep sense of intelligence when you talk because I could tell people like I've, I've read enough and listened to enough people you could tell through cadence through words through purpose how they use them how they leverage them and you could tell when somebody's volleying back and forth with conversation I would say if I if I'm not good at a lot of shit I think I'm good at that and because I think in prison you fucking hear people talk all day yeah and so you can like you know, you pick up on shit well your instincts are probably pretty acute I bet yeah. My man, there you go. <laughs> so you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, and I'm pretty sure. I know. think these but I com- conversations never stop, and I, I absolutely shit. love to have you uh, when you're in Columbus. Because yeah, oh. that's the whole deal with our stuff. These conversations, they don't have an endpoint. We're always working to get to a better place, and we'll die yeah. working to get to a better place. I love cool that. that. I can't tell someone when uh, when John talks to him for like I feel like I'm in like in the military. One moment I'm like, what are we about to come <laughs> just into? Listen, Theo. But no, just it's listen. great though. <laughs> it's great, man. No, I, I love knowing that I have people that I could talk to about business. You know, yeah. I love knowing that if I, you know, uh, this is cool. You know, I'm a big fan of you guys, dude, and um, I'm really, really, Good. really grateful that I came that you guys came out here. Um, you know, Maurice, I think one thing that you do have a gift at is being like. Uh, a liaison to people you know and connecting mm-hmm. people because i mean that is one of the benefits of of having a name you know is that you get to be a bridge you know you really uh you know as much as people sometimes want to use you as a staircase probably um i i, I bet a lot more people probably want to use you as a bridge you know yeah. um, well, so, Ho- yeah. hopefully hopefully through this podcast we can do just that hopefully we get people who listen and hopefully people who like and i've had a ton of people i gotta say now one of the biggest you know, i was talking about earlier uh, one of the biggest things happens when I was in fucking Steak and Shake, not Steak and Shake, st- the In and Out. N- no, I love Shake Shack. Shack. Uh, no, so I was in South Shaquille O'Neal's house. <laughs> <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal. No, uh, <laughs> Penn, Penn, Penn Station. They they said this steak, sh- the, the cheese steaks, and a guy came up to me and the guy was like, "Man," and I thought he was gonna say something about football, but he's like, "Man, I listen to y'all podcast every fucking day." And when he said it, he emphasized. He said, "You don't realize." I learned so much shit from there. And so that, to me, yeah. and when I get DMs from dudes, and these dudes are naming specific things from what we're talking about, and my dudes are sending me text messages about shit that we talked about, 
Dude, that is the most rewarding thing mm-hmm. to let you know that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I think in life, when you when you can do what you are meant to do and you can connect to people in a way that you want to connect, like that is the greatest shit. And I think that that is like what leaves an impact on people. Yeah, I agree, man. I mean, yeah, Mic it's drop. well said. Yeah, I think we're, you guys good, man? Real good, man. It yeah. was awesome. John, Corey, uh, Maurice, thank you so much. Nick, we good? Yeah um yeah just super grateful you guys are here and uh and i look forward to doing it on you guys' podcast in the spring uh this is the business and biceps crew um here on this past weekend thank you guys very much thank you thank you thank you now i'm just floating on the breeze and i feel i'm falling like these leaves i must be cornerstone oh but when i reach that ground i'll share this peace of mind i found i can bones but it's gonna take a little time for me to set that parking brake and let myself all wild shine that light on me I'll sit and tell you my story wow you know what's crazy is my sister can't even read but what does it have to do with us right now Hope you enjoyed that video, and you can watch another. And you can watch this one, you can watch this one. Different options, different choices. Some guy just brings you one option, not this guy. Two options. Watch one. This one or this one.